The gleaming steel scissors glide effortlessly through the sheet of red material, slicing through as if nothing was there. The blood-red fabric parts to either side. A pair of hands pick up one of the pieces and hold it up into the air. The man admires his handiwork before draping the cloth on a dress form and pinning it in place. Although there are many tables in the large room with sewing machines and mannequins next to them, they're all empty. The man works all alone in the big room. And it is impossible not to notice that he's an incredibly handsome man, too. So good-looking that no matter your preferences, you can't help but stop and take notice of his perfect facial features, his slim, fit physique, his lithe, dexterous hands. He brushes a strand of dirty blonde hair away from his vibrant blue eyes and takes a pin out of his mouth before adjusting the fabric just a millimeter more before sticking it in place. The man steps away from the dress form and admires his work. There. Absolutely perfect. There's no doubt that this will be the closing look of the upcoming fashion show. Another masterpiece. Just like him. But that doesn't mean that he's finished. There's still much to be done, and he goes back to work at his table, sewing bits of fabric together to create embellishments for the opulent couture gown. He's so focused on his new design that he doesn't notice the fashion house's operating manager in the hall outside of the workroom. The manager points through the glass window in the door and tells the two police officers with him that this is the man they're looking for. There's been a number of tragic and mysterious crimes involving people connected to this fashion company, and the police have finally closed in on a suspect. Well, not the police exactly, but two SCP Foundation agents posing as police officers. The Foundation became suspicious after learning that there had been several missing persons, murders, and mental breakdowns, all of which involved people connected to this one company. And even more specifically, they were all connected to one man. There was plenty of evidence that something more than just regular criminal activity was happening here. Something strange was happening. Something anomalous. One of the police officers nods at his partner before gesturing for the manager to leave. It's always better not to have civilians present during a containment. The incredibly handsome man still hasn't noticed his guests in the hall, remaining completely absorbed in his work, and he doesn't even look up when the two agents burst into the room, both with guns drawn, not taking any chances. Freeze! Drop your weapon! One of the agents shouts, but the beautiful man doesn't respond and just continues snipping away at fabric with his scissors. I said freeze! He commands again, and this time, the handsome man at least appears to have heard them, finally stopping his work. He slowly looks up with his piercing eyes to gaze at the men who have intruded into his creative workspace. Drop your weapon now, the agent tells him. The man looks over at his hand, which still holds the large pair of scissors, and smiles. He gently places the scissors down on the table, careful not to let them touch the expensive cloth that is rolled out before him. Now put your hands up! This time, there's no response, and the man grips the edge of the table, smiling, and stares into the eyes of the agents, first one, then the other. Hands up or we'll be forced to shoot! The smile slowly leaves the handsome man's face. Will you excuse me for one moment? He says, though with no hint in his voice that it's actually a request. The agents seem unsure of what to do. Both of them appear taken aback and confused by his nonchalant attitude. The handsome man turns away from the agents and quickly steps behind a dressing screen that's been set up near his work table. As he walks behind it, he doesn't break his stride at all. He simply passes behind the screen for mere seconds and steps out on the other side. Only once he steps out, it isn't him anymore. The man that emerges from behind the screen is a completely different person, where once he was slim, graceful, clean-shaven, and dressed in a fine suit, now he is heavy and muscled, like a professional football player with a thick beard and dressed as if he's a member of a SWAT team. Before the agents can even react to the bizarre metamorphosis, the large man charges them and begins attacking. He snaps the neck of one and plunges the scissors he snatched off the table into the other's neck. More SCP containment specialists, these ones dressed in tactical gear with no attempt made to disguise themselves as everyday police, flood into the room and open fire. But the man who looks like a Navy SEAL picks up the fallen agent's guns and begins firing both at the same time. He outguns and outmaneuvers the agents, effortlessly rolling behind cover while constantly firing, taking out agent after agent. Screams fill the air, both from the dying SCP agents as well as the civilians who are struck through the walls by the onslaught, including the manager, who had snuck back to the door window to watch what he thought would be the snobby, handsome man being taken into custody. The window behind the special ops soldier explodes, and two SCP agents rappel through, catching him by surprise and knocking him to the ground. 
It takes even more agents rushing in to hold the man down as he struggles and screams like a wild animal, breaking one of their jaws for good measure before they're finally able to subdue him and confine him with heavy-duty straps. When all is said and done, 17 agents and 10 civilians have lost their lives, but the anomaly has finally been contained. Once it is taken to a secured location, it is given a new designation, SCP-056, but the site staff soon give it a new nickname, calling it simply, a beautiful person. SCP-056 is one of the most deceptive and one of the most dangerous anomalies known to the SCP Foundation. It is a being whose size, gender, and appearance can all vary in an instant, and which will change in response to its environment. The form it has most commonly taken while in containment resembles a man who appears to be in his mid-twenties. His exact looks will vary slightly, but he will always be what could be described as incredibly handsome, at least by traditional societal standards. His clothes will change as well to be a style similar to those of other people around him, though they will always be of a higher quality and more aesthetically pleasing than anyone nearby is wearing. While that appears to be SCP-056's preferred form, it's far from its only one. In addition to the young man, it has also been observed taking on the appearance of several others, including a woman with a striking resemblance to Hollywood actress Scarlett Johansson, a form it took when walking past a group of a younger female staff, a male bodybuilder who could bench press over 250 kilograms, which was 30 kilograms more than the strongest security guard stationed at the Foundation site. It took the form of a female doctor who was measured as having an IQ score 30 points higher than any on-site researchers, as well as non-human forms, like a large, well-groomed Labrador retriever when it was exposed to another researcher's dog, and an extremely aesthetically pleasing couch when left alone in its own containment chamber. These changes from one form to another occur whenever people lose focus on the subject, something that seems to happen when new people are exposed to SCP-056 and once they lose focus, it's able to change in appearance virtually instantaneously. Attempts to film the transformation have resulted in the recording equipment exhibiting the same effect, seemingly losing focus, and being unable to see exactly what happens when SCP-056 changes from one form to another. Its clothing will change along with its bodily form, though so far it hasn't been observed manifesting weapons or other tools. Great efforts have been made to determine SCP-056's original form, Though so far, these have all been met with failure. When placed within an empty concrete cell and placed under constant video surveillance, the cameras experienced the same loss of focus that others did, and then were met with a rather surprising figure left in the room. SCP-056 had taken the form of a video camera, similar to the one being used to record it, though a slightly more advanced and expensive model. Additional attempts were made to discover its true form, this time without direct observation equipment, with researchers instead making use of passive scans that could detect changes to life forms. When they left SCP-056 alone and monitored it using these tools, what they found was… nothing. There was no detectable body temperature, heartbeat, or even weight. It appeared that when not observed, SCP-056 simply ceased to be. Those who have personal contact with SCP-056 often report that the anomalous entity makes them feel substandard or jealous, as if they can't measure up to it, yet at the same time will seem to seek its approval. This extends to SCP security staff, who will express a desire to follow its commands, while researchers will try to argue with it, something that usually results in them leaving its containment cell feeling as though they were outwitted by its intelligence and SCP-056's expert communication abilities seem not to be limited by complex subjects or language barriers. Research has shown it to be fluent in at least 200 different dialects, and it has exhibited an expert level of knowledge in such varied topics as fashion, automobiles, theoretical science, sports, and a multitude of others, all of which it will usually show a greater knowledge of than the person it is conversing with. And despite leaving the conversations feeling dejected about their own abilities, those who talk to it will almost always express a desire to speak with SCP-056 again, as if they can't resist being made to feel inadequate by it. A number of tests were then performed to discover just what form SCP-056 would take when presented with various situations, and the results were rather interesting. In the first, a male Class D personnel was given a knife and told to try and attack SCP-056. 056 quickly took the form of a young, fit man who was able to effortlessly disarm the attacking D-Class and killed him with the knife instead. In another test, a female D-Class entered its cell not with a weapon, but with a bottle of expensive wine. They were met with SCP-056 in the form of a young, beautiful woman who accepted the wine, but upon trying it, spit it out in the D-Class's face and sent them away. 
Next, researchers sent two D-classes in at the same time, one male and one female, with no specific orders at all. SCP-056 appeared as a beautiful woman in a well-tailored business suit, who proceeded to examine both the D-classes, pointing out their each and every physical flaw before sending them two on their way. Researchers then tried sending ten Class D personnel into the cell, all of whom were male and who had expressed a romantic preference for females. SCP-056 appeared as an especially beautiful female in a low-cut red dress. 056 didn't interact with the group in any way, but after ten minutes, the D-classes began to look uncomfortable. Soon, an all-out brawl broke out between the D-classes as they violently assaulted each other, apparently for SCP-056's approval. 056 seemed to watch the melee with pleasure for several minutes before calling an end to it and sending them all out. A member of staff then volunteered to be tested with SCP-056, a level 4 personnel who was regarded as being especially beautiful herself. She entered SCP-056's cell, where the anomaly took the form of a similarly beautiful, professional-looking woman, and the two proceeded to have a conversation, discussing various advanced personnel management techniques. The discussion seemed amiable, but after 90 minutes, the staff member appeared to become infuriated with SCP-056 and quickly left the room. While no cross-tests with other SCPs have yet to be performed, when asked about other anomalies, SCP-056 shows a rare instance of vulnerability, expressing hatred towards them, and even occasionally, fear. SCP-056 has been relatively benign in its time in SCP containment, seemingly content to spend its time around Foundation staff. It's been allowed to have a cell of its own choosing, as well as pick its own furnishings, which have tended towards expensive and fashionable decor. Security staff assigned to guard it are equipped with high-powered tranquilizers, and any staff that exhibit mental irregularities after extended exposure to SCP-056 must undergo immediate psychological examination. It has frequently asked for access to the internet, and when asked why it desires that, SCP-056 responded that the Foundation was unable to provide it with enough psychophants, and that it wanted the whole world to know its face. Needless to say, its request for internet access was denied, and the anomaly, which has been classified as Euclid, continues to be securely cut off from the general public and remains in Foundation containment. Warning lights flash, and heavy boots stomp down the sanitized hallways of Site-19. A mobile task force has been dispatched, wielding heavy weaponry and wearing tactical gear. But underneath their jet black armor, these mobile task operatives are sweating. The SCP thereafter has a very particular set of skills, skills that make them a nightmare to people like this team. Plainly put, anything that the mobile task force can do, the anomaly can do better. Because the anomaly that chose to breach containment is SCP-056, codenamed A Beautiful Person. This shape-shifting being takes the form of a superior version of whatever object or entity it encounters, though typically only by a relatively slim margin. The Foundation has no real way of truly containing SCP-056 because of the unique nature of its anomalous abilities. Instead, their tactic has long been playing to the truly toxic ego of the creature, designing the containment chamber more like a luxury hotel room, perfectly suited to 056's refined taste. However, as a sentient being with a mean streak, keeping an entity like 056 permanently caged is rarely as simple as sprucing up said cage. Some days, like today, 056 will want a change of scenery, and on those days, there's almost nothing the Foundation can do to stop it. As the mobile task forces dispatched to Site-19 scan the halls and spool through security footage, desperately hoping to find some clue as to the vain creature's presence, 056 is actually long gone. Having assumed the form of a handsome, charming scientist after an average-looking scientist with bad social skills walked past its containment chamber, 056 had slipped out of the site undetected before anyone even realized that a breach had occurred. Then, seeing a vulture fly overhead, 056 had taken the form of a bald eagle and flown further, leaving the isolated Site-19 in the dust. 056 is ready and eager for a night on the town, but when 056 decides it's going to paint the town red, it doesn't always mean it in the metaphorical sense. 056 arrives in a small American town, like many that pop up along lonely desert highways. Noticing a plain, unremarkable woman walking past, it immediately transforms into an absolute stunner, with fine diamond jewelry and an expensive-looking red dress. As she walks to a local diner, she turns heads from everyone she passes, doing nothing to hide her conceited smirk. I really should do this more often, she thinks. 
when she passes a self-conscious looking woman with a fake Gucci handbag, 056, suddenly manifests the real deal, brimming with stacks of cash and even more jewelry. Everywhere she goes, her mere presence makes people feel terrible about themselves, and she couldn't be happier. She walks into a local diner, where a report on the radio is detailing abandoned, wrecked cars found along the side of a local highway. There were bodies inside in horrific states, so horrific that they couldn't even share the details on the broadcast. But 056 doesn't care about any of that. She simply orders some pancakes in the diner and rudely asks the cashier if he can break a $100 bill. When she receives her pancakes, she takes a single bite before throwing them at the wall and complaining about how terrible they are, then leaving. She takes joy in knowing how awful this will make people feel. On the way out, she decides to take a shortcut down a dark alley, where a woman in expensive clothes, carrying an expensive purse brimming with money, is liable to attract the wrong kind of attention. Two muggers, one armed with a switchblade and the other armed with a gun, emerge from the darkness, wearing malicious grins. That purse looks a little heavy there, lady, one of the muggers says. Yeah, how about you let us carry it for you, the other adds. 056 smiles and says, Are you sure you have the upper body strength? They don't take kindly to this. As the two muggers prepare to beat this strange woman within an inch of her life and steal all her earthly belongings, she suddenly transforms, shapeshifting into a ripped kung fu master in white robes. Before either of the muggers can respond to this baffling transformation, 056, in his kung fu master form, is beating the living hell out of them and leaving the dastardly duo in a crumpled heap on the ground as he walks away, whistling a merry tune. But making women feel inadequate, insulting small businesses, and beating up petty criminals isn't enough for SCP-056. This thoroughly unpleasant anomaly has the need for speed, and the best way to achieve that need is to obtain a car, or perhaps, even better, become one. Not long after the thought passes his mind, 056 arrives at a parking lot. He looks over the various parked cars, most of which are unremarkable specimens. That is, until he comes across a parked Ferrari and feels his imagination begin to soar with possibilities. A Ferrari? Oh, I can do better than that. In the following moments, SCP-056 flawlessly shapeshifts into a brand new, cherry red Bugatti sports car and starts doing gleeful donuts in the parking lot. 056 then puts the pedal to the metal and speeds out onto the road, where it can pick up some real speed having no idea that for once, it would attract some attention it didn't want. But 056 doesn't care about that yet. It's too focused on breaking its speedometer with sheer insane speed, tearing down the highway at over 100 miles an hour, then building and building and building. 056 is lucky that there are seemingly no other cars on the road tonight, well, except one that it notices far in the distance behind itself. Is that a beat up old police cruiser? How embarrassing. 056 speeds up even more, hoping to leave the police cruiser as little more than a distant memory, but it doesn't work out that way. Instead, the beat-up police cruiser miles behind 056's sleek supercar begins to build in speed. Little by little, it seems to be doing the impossible, catching up. Being a thoroughly arrogant and unpleasant anomaly, 056 doesn't take the prospect of being humiliated lightly. It decides to take a sharp left turn off of the highway onto a mostly dirty side road, slowing down slightly, as though to challenge the police cruiser to carry on the chase. The police cruiser accepts the challenge and makes the turn after 056 with shocking speed. How is this busted up old police cruiser keeping pace with a brand new anomalous Bugatti? 056 doesn't understand, but it won't give in. It has to keep believing it's the best, no matter what. 056 tears off down the road until it reaches some dense woods with only a single dirt road cutting through the middle. The Bugatti's wheels kick up mud and dry leaves, its roaring engine sending the animals of the forest scattering in every direction. And still, the police cruiser follows, its high beams cutting through the murky gloom of the forest. Suddenly, it goes from eerie silence, save for the roar of twin engines, to the flashes of red and blue lights and the shrill wail of the police cruiser's siren. 056 finds the whole arrangement laughable. It's escaped the SCP Foundation before. Did some small town cop really believe he could take 056 down? But what 056 doesn't know is that it isn't being followed by just any small town cop. It gets a clue to the true horrifying nature of its pursuer when the Bugatti's radio crackles into life and a single word begins endlessly repeating in a warped, scratchy voice suffused with static. Run, 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 run. 
056 is at a loss. This doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be possible for any normal police cruiser to have this effect, unless... Before 056 can even finish the thought, the police cruiser closes the distance in a single freakish burst of speed. It smashes into the back of the Bugatti and rams it into a brutal tailspin, sending it skidding off the dirt road and crashing into the trees, where it flips twice and comes to rest upside down. Totaled. Its radio still repeats that single warp ominous word. Run, 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 run. 056 is stunned as it lays, injured and in car form, against the cold and unyielding trees of this dark, isolated forest. How is that even possible? It doesn't make sense. Is this police cruiser some kind of undercover tactical vehicle in league with those worthless worms at the SCP Foundation? The police cruiser has ground to a halt on the dirt road, idling, its light still cutting through the gloom. The driver's door, marked with the words, protect and serve, slides open, and a shadowy figure steps out. 056 can immediately sense an inhuman presence in its midst. This may look like some doughy, middle-aged cop with a handlebar mustache, but that's just a disguise. And if anyone understands disguises, it's SCP-056. What 056 doesn't know is that the entity about to attack it is, in fact, known to the SCP Foundation, but isn't aligned with them in the slightest. They refer to it as SCP-973, codenamed Smokey an anomalous police cruiser that contains a terrifying occupant. It's known as one of the more deadly, mysterious, and sadistic creatures that the Foundation still hasn't fully succeeded in containing. Any humans who fall prey to it have a terrifying demise in store for them, but how would an anomaly fare? We're about to find out. Smokey, the nightmarish anomalous police officer, begins walking down the grassy bank towards the overturned Bugatti. His skin is paper pale. His eyes glow a burning brimstone red. He clenches his pale, veiny fists, excited by the thought of the coming violence. This idiot in the sports car really thought it could get away from him? No one gets away from Smokey. Exit the vehicle, boy, Smokey says in a crackling southern drawl, or I'm gonna rip you out of it. But Smokey doesn't wait for an answer. He charges forward and digs his fingers into the metal of the car, displaying his terrifying superhuman strength. He begins tearing away parts of the car, peeling back panels of metal like a normal person would peel an orange. He imagines the terror of the person within, the sweet fruit under all these layers of obstruction. Gonna get you, boy, he repeats, voice almost shaking with excitement. Gonna get you, gonna get you, gonna make you scream, gonna make you scream like a scared little piggy. Then suddenly, the car just vanishes. The chunks of metal he's holding are gone, Smokey looks around, baffled. He's done strange and terrible things on these roads, but this is still a new one, even for him. He looks up and stares into the darkness of the forest. The car is nowhere to be seen out there. Where are you, boy? Smokey rasps. You think you can run from me? Smokey hears a subdued scoff coming from behind the tree in front of him, followed by a tall, dark stranger stepping out into the dim light of the cruiser's high beams. It's SCP-056 but it isn't taking the form of a luxury sports car anymore. Now, it's taking the form of a cinematic legend, Dirty Harry, as played by Clint Eastwood, the ultimate shoot first, ask questions later cop. You think I'm running from you, punk? Harry asked. Truth is, I was sick of looking at that ugly mug of yours. Figured I'd take five, before I came back and put a bullet through it. Smokey growls, his jaw unhinging and extending into a horrific black hole. Not exactly disproving my point there, Slick, Harry chided. Smokey isn't one for trading barbs. He runs towards Harry with his hands extended, claws growing out of the tips of his fingers. But Harry knows he's dealing with a monster now, and he's ready to fight back. Quicker than Smokey can even notice, Harry reaches into a holster in his coat and pulls out his trademark weapon, a 44 Magnum revolver, one of the most powerful revolvers ever made, and he's a dead shot with it. Harry draws a bead on Smokey and fires a high-powered round through the monster's forehead. Smokey is staggered for a moment, seemingly almost stunned by the shot, but the effects wear off quickly. Smokey roars and swings for Harry, who dodges in the nick of time. Smokey's clawed hand tears through the bark of a nearby tree. 056 buries a moment of quiet anxiety. It thinks, even for me, this thing is powerful. I need to watch my step. You ought to show me some respect, boy, Smokey growls. I'm a man of the law. You have no idea what you're dealing with. He swings again and again for Harry, forcing him further back into the forest. 
tries its best to maintain that unflappable Eastwood calm. Respect is earned, not given, punk, Harry says, leveling his magnum. You think you're hot stuff because you torture and terrorize? Putting down scum like you is exactly why I joined the force. Harry unleashes, emptying the cylinder into Smokey's center mass. Bang, 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 bang. Smokey's body does the bullet dance as Harry's magnum rounds punch into him like hypersonic metal fists. Smokey digs his feet into the ground and steadies himself. Harry reaches into his pocket for some spare rounds, discharges the empty shells from the cylinder, and begins quickly reloading the revolver. Smokey gives him no quarter. The demonic cop charges forward and grabs Harry by the lapels of his suit jacket, lifting him off the ground and slamming his back into a nearby tree. The revolver falls from his hand and clatters to the forest floor. Smokey has the upper hand now. His grip is ironclad. It seems as though 056, even as Dirty Harry, won't be able to escape this one. Smokey presses him against the tree until 056 can feel the bark creaking and his bones beginning to buckle. Not so talky now, aren't we, boy? Smokey snickers. I'm gonna kill you slow. You're gonna beg for mercy. You're a good fighter, 056 said, beginning to shift. But I'm better. Moments later, SCP-056 is no longer Dirty Harry. Now, he's John Wick. The movie super assassin specialized in almost every form of combat. Smokey is briefly confused, and 056 takes advantage of that. With a few expert strikes to Smokey's face, 056 is able to wriggle out of his grip and kick Smokey in the chest, creating some distance between them. Let's go. It's been too long since I've had a decent workout, 056, as John Wick says. Smokey reaches for John Wick, but John, drawing upon his years of combat experience, blocks Smokey's attack and returns a brutal flurry of blows to Smokey's face and chest. Every time Smokey swings with his supernatural strength, 056 swipes at his arms and uses his momentum against him. While Smokey clearly has the strength advantage by the nature of SCP-056's anomalous ability, this form clearly trounces Smokey in terms of skill. Part of 056 is afraid, having rarely been met with this level of resistance. Another part of 056 is exhilarated. Getting to be better than an entity this formidable is a truly thrilling experience. You're really starting to get on my nerves, boy, Smokey says, pulling out a nightstick from his police belt. 056 draws a long titanium combat knife out of his coat. Prove it, he says, assuming a knife fighting stance. Smokey swings for 056 with his nightstick, who blocks it with the edge of his blade. What follows is almost a kind of sword fight, where 056 and Smokey take turns striking and parrying with their respective weapons. 056 cracks his neck, giving a smarmy grin that only irritates Smokey further. The demonic cop throws his nightstick directly at 056's face. The arrogant anomaly is able to deflect the well-aimed stick with his knife, only to realize that it was just a distraction from the following haymaker. Smokey's fist collides with 056's cheek with the force of a runaway car. It knocks him off his feet, taking his legs out from under him and throwing him to the ground with a mighty thud. And Smokey doesn't let up. He crouches over the stunned 056 and strikes him again and again, pounding his clenched fists into 056's head. If the self-obsessed anomaly had any chance to speak, it probably would have yelled, Not the face! Not the face! Unlucky for 056, mercy is not a word in Smokey's vocabulary. 056 doesn't have time to transform. With every punch, 056's body is pounded deeper into the dirt. He can feel himself losing consciousness under the flurry of blows. For the first time, he's truly terrified about what will happen to him if he passes out. What terrible things will Smokey do to him? Suddenly, floodlights illuminate the forest from every angle. The hum of helicopters sound from far above. Tactical vehicles surround the forest manned by highly trained, highly armed SCP Foundation mobile task forces. Snipers line up their shots on Smokey, preparing to fire with armor-piercing 50 caliber rounds. Ground troops armed with assault rifles all pour in. As though a magic spell has been cast, Smokey, along with his cursed cruiser, disappears. All that's left is a bruised, bloody, and disoriented SCP-056, still shaking in pain and terror on the ground. It doesn't take long for 056 to be surrounded by Foundation personnel, ready to take it back into containment. To even its own surprise, it's tremendously relieved. 056, whimpering, says, I'd like to go back to my room, please. Who are you talking to? The young boy spins around, surprised to find his father standing behind him. The boy seems nervous and hesitant to answer, but after being asked again, 
he admits to his father that he was talking to the lady in the fountain. The boy's father is confused. The lady in the fountain? That's right. The boy explains that she is nice, just like mom. He thinks the woman in the fountain may even be his mom. The father sighs. He takes the boy's hand and leads him back inside the house, where the father is hosting a small get-together. One of the father's guests asks if things are okay, and he tells her that everything is fine. He's just worried about his son. It has been a very difficult year following the death of his wife. He tells her that he's afraid he might be developing behavioral issues as he watches the boy staring out the window at the fountain in their backyard. Later that week in school, the children are supposed to be drawing pictures of their families. The teacher moves from child to child, checking on their progress, and stops at the boy. She wants to know what he's working on. The boy explains that it is a drawing of him, his dad, and his mom who lives in the fountain. The teacher doesn't understand. His mom lives in the fountain? That's right, the boy tells her. The fountain in their backyard was her favorite place in the whole world. His mother had told him that it was a magical place and was the reason they bought the house. After she died, he heard a voice coming from the fountain. It doesn't sound like his mom, but he knows it's her. She lives in the fountain now. The father thanks the teacher for calling and promises that he'll talk to his son. He's very sorry that the other children are frightened by the stories about a woman in their fountain, and he's going to make sure this whole business comes to an end for good. That night, as he is putting the boy to bed, he tells him that he knows he misses his mom, but he needs to stop with all of these claims about a woman in the fountain. And as much as he misses her and wishes that his mother would come back, he needs to realize that she's gone and not coming back. The father kisses the boy in the forehead and tells him one more time that there will be no more stories about the woman before tucking him in for the night. As soon as his father is gone though, the boy gets out of bed, creeps to his bedroom window that looks down on their backyard, and stares at the fountain. He watches as reflections dance on the rippling water. The water goes oddly still, until a hand that appears to be made out of water seems to emerge out of the surface of the fountain and waves at him. The father leaves the bathroom and glances in to check on his son before heading back to his bedroom. He bolts upright when it dawns on him that his son wasn't in bed. He runs into the son's room and pulls the blankets off the bed, but no one is there. He frantically calls for his son and looks around the room when he sees something. He hurries to the window where he watches as his son walks towards the fountain. But what really has his attention is the woman, translucent and shining under the moonlight, beckoning for the boy to approach her. The father rushes downstairs and out into the backyard, where his son is in an embrace with the watery woman. He is terrified, but his fatherly instincts take over and he sprints to the fountain and rips the boy away from the creature. As he pulls the boy back from the fountain, he watches as the solid, watery figure of the woman appears to turn back into a liquid and collapse into the fountain. The father brings the boy inside the house. He doesn't understand what's going on, but the father just keeps repeating that he's okay. He's safe now. The next day, the father is on the phone with their local priest. He knows how crazy this sounds, but the police didn't believe him, and he didn't know where else to turn. The priest tells him not to worry, that he will be there soon to take care of it. The priest arrives at the house with two assistants and tells the father that it would be best if he and his son leave. The boy is crying, pleading with him not to hurt the nice woman in the fountain. The father has to struggle to restrain his son, but eventually is able to get him out of the house. Once they're gone, the priest turns to his assistants. He takes off his shirt to reveal a tactical vest underneath emblazoned with the SCP logo as his assistants do the same. Time for containment, he says, as they head out into the backyard towards the fountain and the anomalous creature that lives there. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-054, also known as the Water Nymph. SCP-054 is the designation that the SCP Foundation has given to an anomalous entity with some very strange properties. Made up of 9 liters of what appears to be completely normal spring water, SCP-054 most often appears in the form of a female humanoid, but it is capable of a variety of forms, such as other humanoids and simple geometric shapes. It is unknown just how it is capable of taking and holding these shapes, or how it moves around once it does so since all tests performed so far have failed to show any thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or other phenomenon present in its body that could explain its abilities. Whenever SCP-054 enters a body of water, it will become indistinguishable from the surrounding water, and it appears that it must fully submerge itself on occasion in order to replenish its full volume, which is constantly being reduced through normal evaporation. 
Water that has evaporated off of the anomaly has also been collected by the Foundation, and it too is indiscernible from regular water and exhibits no special properties. After its discovery, SCP-054 was moved to Site-08 for containment, where additional research and study of the creature could take place. Its special containment cell was made watertight and equipped with a specialized climate control system, as well as an ornate fountain filled with fresh spring water. Surprisingly, the entity seemed to enjoy its new home, and appeared happy to interact with Foundation researchers, guards, and maintenance staff, frequently mimicking their forms often in a playful manner. While at first, 054 would retreat back into its fountain when it wasn't interacting with staff, as time went on, it seemed to grow more and more comfortable, and eventually came to spend almost all of its time outside of the water. Though it would still always return back to the safety of the fountain and disappear into the water when attempts were made to extract samples directly from its body. Though it avoided having its water drawn, it was through a variety of different tests by SCP researcher Dr. Seskel that much of the Foundation's knowledge of SCP-054 was gained. Though whether the methods researchers used to acquire this information were appropriate is up to you to decide. In a test dubbed the Water Loss Experiment, SCP-054 was denied access to water. As a result, its shape changed, with 054 becoming more compact, most likely in order to reduce its surface area as much as possible and reduce the rate of evaporation that occurred. For the first few days after access to water was removed, it would happily greet anyone who entered its containment cell, which may indicate that it was attempting to charm staff into providing water. When after a few days its water supply was still not turned on, it stopped acting especially cheery, perhaps realizing that its happy disposition was doing nothing to advance its cause. In an extreme temperature test, researchers were authorized to experiment with subjecting SCP-054 to temperatures below zero degrees Celsius. The entity became more and more lethargic as the temperature in the testing area was lowered and eventually froze completely. Ice chips were collected for study, but analysis revealed no abnormalities or differences from standard water. The opposite test was also performed, and the temperature was raised to 95 degrees Celsius, just shy of the 100 degree boiling point of water. 054 became very aggressive as the temperature approached the upper threshold at which water can remain a liquid, and it attempted to escape the testing enclosure. Researchers noticed that following this test, the entity became increasingly resistant to being moved from its containment cell to the testing area, likely fearing that the researchers intended to do it harm. SCP-054's memory was tested as well, and it proved very skilled at solving puzzles and navigating mazes. Researchers initially had an issue with motivating 054 to participate, but Dr. Seskel discovered that the anomaly was quite responsive to the use of electrical shocks. The researchers would often push 054 too hard in these tests though, and soon found that they would need to give it a 48-hour rest period between any strenuous experiments. The final test performed was meant to gain some insight into how SCP-054 maintains its form, by seeing how it reacted to a hydrochloric acid solution. It unsurprisingly resisted this test, and the temperature in the testing area was lowered to just above freezing in order to try and control its behavior. This did not prove to be enough though. SCP-054 fought back against Dr. Seskel and his research assistant, seriously injuring both of them and necessitating a halt to the test. In fact, all testing on SCP-054 was stopped following this incident, as it appeared to develop an extreme mistrust of males, who made up the majority of the staff who had been performing the tests. Following this attack on the Foundation staff, SCP-054 was classified as Euclid. However, once the tests ceased and 054 no longer had to come in contact with the research staff who were in charge of the experiments, there was a span of over five years without any further incidents. Following this period, SCP-054's rating was downgraded to safe and now seems willing to begin participating in experiments once again, though now all tests fall under the purview of Biology Unit E7 and the use of only female personnel is recommended. Though classified as safe, Caution must still be maintained when working with SCP-054. Maintenance personnel are required to wear chemical suits when working inside the containment area, and must spend 10 minutes in a special drying room once they exit to ensure that 054 has not somehow managed to cling to any part of them. In the event of a containment breach, the entire enclosure is to be flushed with liquid nitrogen to freeze the entity. Is the Water Nymph an example of the SCP Foundation going too far? containing a harmless anomaly who appears happy and benign until harm is done to it.
Or is this simply the price we must pay in order to further our knowledge of anomalies and potentially stop a dangerous threat to humanity? The answer to that question is up to you. It started with a woman. We'll call her Valerie. It doesn't matter whether or not that it's her real name, since her real name is lost, even to herself. Valerie was a young woman, but what many would describe as a very old soul. She'd been to strange places, seen awful things, and gotten in touch with some dangerous people. Like a lot of people with hard lives, Valerie tried to find relief wherever she could. Partying, gambling, buying herself expensive things. After all, she was here for a good time, not a long time, and she wanted to eke out any pleasure she could while she was still able. That's how she ended up in the high rollers section of a very exclusive private club in New York City. They had the finest drinks, the most attentive wait staff, and the strangest entertainment. But that's the kind of exceptional service you can expect from a club run by one of the most powerful and influential clandestine enterprises in the world, Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited. Valerie had no idea who the club's owner was, though. She had come here with a wealthy friend. Well, calling them a friend might be pushing it. She was here with someone she had met earlier that night. But now, as she sipped her drink and played another hand of blackjack, she realized that he was nowhere to be seen. Oh well, she didn't have anybody to please but herself, and the clubs of Marshall, Carter, and Dark can provide plenty of pleasure, as long as you can pay. Valerie's problem was that she didn't have the money to keep living large off of their largesse, and she was about to get a rude awakening as to just how much these mysterious businessmen value their bottom line. If she took a second to think about it, she may have noticed she was out of place among the rest of the clientele. Wealthy businessmen and shady moguls in fine suits. What was a girl like her doing in a place like this? Unless, of course, she was here to fulfill another purpose entirely. Eventually, a bill was presented to Valerie. Oh, this isn't for me, she told the waiter. My friend is taking care of everything. When she went to motion towards the wealthy man who had brought her here, she realized huh? that he was nowhere to be seen. I'm afraid the gentleman I believe you're referring to left some time ago, the waiter told her. Valerie was disappointed, but this kind of thing had happened to her before. She reached for her purse. It looked like she'd be paying for herself that night. All right, how much do I owe you? She said as she grabbed a handful of chips from her stack. I'm afraid you might be a little confused, the waiter told her, eyeing what at most could be a couple hundred dollars in casino chips. Are you not aware of what you're drinking? Valerie glanced huh? at the bottle of champagne sitting next to her and then at the other two identical empty bottles sitting next to it. It's the champagne he ordered, Valerie answered. Yes, said the waiter, but that isn't just any champagne. Valerie's eyes began to grow wide as he went on. Those are from a very rare and very expensive vintage. How rare? Valerie nervously asked. Extremely rare, the waiter told her. Each bottle you were drinking cost... It felt like the room suddenly filled with rushing water. The edges of her vision dimmed as a roar filled her ears, as she heard the last thing the waiter said. Each bottle she had drank cost $20,000. When Valerie regained her senses, she was being escorted by a group of tall gentlemen in dark business suits into a soundproof back room, where they explained the severity of her situation. As the fear continued to set in, she started to beg. She said that if they just gave her a little more time, she could earn back the money she owed them. The solemn-faced representative explained to her that Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited doesn't operate like that. However, there would be other ways that she could pay back her debt to them, but it would be their way. They gave a brief explanation that providing luxury private clubs to an esteemed clientele was only one part of their enterprise. The other side of their business was even more exclusive an auction house where truly unique products are sold to the highest bidders. And come to think of it, there was a hole in the market that seemed to be just Valerie's size. All they asked for was for her to spend a period of time in their service, and when the debt was repaid, her life would be hers once more. And there was more to it as well. Although she would have to work for them, time would not actually pass for her during her service. She'd get to keep her youth. It would be as if she'd never worked for them at all, a blink of an eye and she'd be right back where she was. Valerie took just a moment to consider it. She wasn't sure she believed what these men were telling her, but she'd heard and seen some very strange things in her life. Was this really so hard to believe? And after all, what choice did she have? She didn't have $60,000. So she agreed to repay her debt to Marshall, Carter, and Dark, and do whatever that entailed. The representatives assured her that all she'd need to do is lay back and relax. They'd take care of the rest. 
Valerie didn't remember much after that moment, but she awoke in the dark. She couldn't move any part of her body other than her eyes. The next time she saw the light, she remembered being up on stage, looking down at a crowd of people wielding auction paddles, while an animated auctioneer reeled off the many advantages of some product she couldn't see. Certain words and phrases stuck out. Fully articulated and posable, warm to the touch, not a blemish on her, never talks back, she'll always look you right in the eye. Eventually, someone won, and she was placed back in the darkness. Years went by, being taken in and out of the dark by strangers, wearing different clothes and being referred to by different names, moving only when she was permitted. Little by little, she forgot the person that she once was. One day ran into the next. It all became a blur of darkness, punctuated by brief flashes of light. Years turned into decades. She never said a word. She forgot what it even felt like to be able to speak. But then one day, out of the darkness, appeared a pair of strangers in black tactical gear who looked at her with an expression somewhere in between pity and disgust. From that moment on, she finally found a new name to replace that empty void. Now, she was SCP-446. The files on SCP-446 are as mysterious as they are deeply disconcerting, and we can only speculate as to the exact process that led to the creation of SCP-446, since the duplicitous salesmen at Marshall, Carter & Dark Limited don't seem eager to share their secrets with anyone outside of their organization. But what SCP Foundation researchers have learned from solid, empirical observation is that SCP-446 is a humanoid mannequin 1.75 meters tall and weighing 52.16 kilograms. She is, or perhaps was, a pale-skinned Caucasian woman who appears to be in her early 20s. She has brown hair that measures 17.78 centimeters at its longest point, brilliant, bright blue eyes, and the distinctive Marshall Carter & Dark Limited logo tattooed on her lower back. In many ways, she has all the hallmarks of a living human being. She's superficially anatomically correct, with realistic skin tone and texture, eye coloration and sclera clarity, and researchers who've dealt with her directly claim that she has the warmth of a real human being. Despite seeming to be alive, though, SCP-446 doesn't respond to verbal communication, has no pulse or heartbeat, and she doesn't even appear to breathe. Whether SCP-446 can truly be considered alive is still an open question among Foundation researchers. SCP-446 is stored in the same hinged metal box she was found in, which is plain save for a series of clothing measurements for those wishing to purchase their own custom accessories. When Foundation field agents first discovered her, they attempted to sit her up. However, what they found was that she responded to their touch, sitting up on her own. All it took to get her to lay back down was a gentle push on her shoulders from the front. Through further study, it was discovered that selective touch cues can induce different types of movement in SCP-446. She could be induced to stand up on her own, and through gentle pressure applied to the top of the head, she could be induced to sit or lay back down on her own. You may have also noticed the somewhat uncanny quality of SCP-446's eyes. Please don't be alarmed. It isn't anything out of the ordinary. Her eyes will follow the nearest person to her around the room, and she'll try to make eye contact if possible. Don't let it bother you. Everyone gets used to it eventually. Her limbs can also be posed and manipulated as required, even into positions requiring balance, like standing on one leg. However, if pushed over, she will immediately lose balance and fall. It seems almost as though her actions are defined as much by the toucher's intent as the touch itself. Essentially out of any more ways to learn about SCP-446, an in-depth medical examination was authorized. Given the humanoid nature of 446, the doctor conducting the examination decided to proceed in a manner similar to the kinds of autopsies given to non-anomalous human corpses. The doctor noted being disturbed by the fact huh? that 446's eyes kept following them, even as they prepared the tools for the autopsy. They also remarked on the almost freakish clearness of the subject's skin. There wasn't a single detectable mark or blemish, almost like a porcelain doll. There was no rigor or liver mortis, nor any signs of damage or injury to the body. Examination of the mouth revealed an obstruction at the top of the throat, a metal plate fixed to the back of her mouth, bonded to the flesh on all sides. The plate shifts slightly when touched, but couldn't be removed. Similar plates had been installed in the ear canals, nostrils, and all other body orifices, as if to ensure that nothing can enter or exit 446's body. The doctor then moved on to the internal examination of SCP-446, beginning with a number of x-rays. These revealed several irregularly shaped masses inside 446's body, covering major organs such as the heart, brain, kidneys, and liver. 
Dissection revealed these masses to be boxes of various shapes and sizes, constructed from the same metal that comprises the obstructive plates. These boxes are connected to the corresponding organs through a series of wires and tubes. The doctor notes that neither their scalpel nor their wire saw could cause any meaningful damage to the boxes, and that it's possible the boxes not only keep the body preserved, but also allow for its limited set of movements. Certain barriers presented themselves during the dissection process, both physical and psychological. SCP-446 exhibited an extraordinary healing factor, fully repairing her own skin minutes after having her chest fully opened in a Y incision. This made sustained internal observation difficult, and the doctor declined to perform any more extensive mutilations for fear that the damage would be irreparable. This limited the progress that could be made in the procedures overall. However, it wasn't the worst thing to occur during the dissection. The doctor noted that SCP-446 stared at them the entire time while they were making incisions into the body, making them extremely uncomfortable. And during the several-minute healing process of the Y incision in her chest, SCP-446's mouth moved, as if speaking silently the entire time. The doctor left a note that this may suggest a level of sapience in 446, though nothing could be proved conclusively on that front. The file for SCP-446 is a relatively sparse one, given the minimal containment requirements of the anomaly. Between studies, she is simply kept in her box. There has, however, been one notable incident involving SCP-446, documented by Foundation researcher Dr. Sunderland back in 2010. The event, labeled Incident 446-1, took place in Storage Room 6. In the interest of preserving the anomaly's modesty, she was dressed in a standard D-Class uniform before being placed back into her box for the night. A guard reported a strange thumping noise later that evening, and investigated himself and found it was coming from the inside of SCP-446's box. Dr. Sunderland was called in at this point and oversaw the opening of the box. It turned out that SCP-446 was repeatedly attempting to rise to a sitting pose inside the box and was banging her head against the lid. Finally freed, SCP-446 rose to her feet of her own volition for the first time since the start of her containment. She assumed a strange pose, her head bowed and her wrists touching above her head, as though her hands were bound at the wrists, or she was desperately praying or begging. Her facial expression also shifted for the first time, taking on a look of sadness and fear. Dr. Sunderland was able to make SCP-446 return to a more neutral standing position but nothing could make her permanently assume the laying position again until the D-Class uniform was once again removed. There is still not a confirmed explanation as to why exactly this happened, but the answers may be too horrible to even consider. For this particular anomaly, which has been given the safe class designation, perhaps the kindest thing to do is leave her in the box. That's at least a more humane fate than whatever Marshall, Carter, and Dark had planned. The storm wrenches the fishing vessel in half, the yawning sound of metal buckling and ripping can barely be heard over the explosive waves. Crew members pour out of the fragmented ship, washed away with the water, like ants fleeing a flooding nest. The deck lurches and tips upwards into the air. A wave crashes against it, almost knocking the sailor off the railing, but he clings on for dear life. Soaked through, shivering violently, and feeling the dreaded exhaustion creeping into his limbs, he looks around helplessly as his crewmates drown around him. Only one man remains on the deck with him, but the captain's usual steely confidence has gone. Behind the man's bushy beard and grizzled skin, the sailor sees a little boy scared out of his mind. The captain grabs the sailor by the scruff of the neck and hauls him close enough for them to shout over the sound of the seas around them. I saw her! The captain's rambling and ranting, repeating himself and gesticulating wildly at the seas around them. A naiad! I saw her in the water this morning! Our voyage was cursed from the start! We should never have left port. She's in the water now, she… A colossal wave throws what is left of the boat through the air. The railing slips through the sailor's fingers as he flies high between the waves. For a moment, the world stands still. It's like he's a gull hovering in place, surveying the carnage beneath him. And there in the water, what looks like… But the world isn't standing still. He hurtles back towards the ocean and slams into it, hard enough to knock the air clean out of his lungs. Icy water tugs at him, pulling him downwards, deeper and deeper, colder and colder. Like arms wrapping around him, dragging him. The sailor wakes with a start, water laps at his face. What were once hulking waves are now little more than ripples. He spits out a mouthful of sand and shakes his head, his body's trembling violently from the cold. 
but the warm glow of the sun on his back is already doing its best to help him. How on earth had he survived that? There are groans all around him. Dotted along the beach are his fellow fishermen. He hasn't got the energy to count them, but it doesn't look like all of them. Just ahead of him, further up the beach, sits the captain. Rocking back and forth, trembling, the captain noiselessly points a finger out to sea. Using what little energy he has left, the sailor rolls onto his back to see the silhouette of a woman standing there on the water. No, not a silhouette. The morning sunlight is shining straight through her as if she's made of nothing but water. She steps delicately across the surface of the water, walking towards the coughing fishermen who have all seen her by now. There's a delicacy to how she walks, tiptoeing gently on the rippling water, as if scared of disturbing it even slightly. The light dances and glitters on her skin like it does across the ocean. No, not skin. She really is made of water. Every inch of her is composed entirely of what looks like the purest, cleanest water the sailor has ever seen. Was it her? The arms that he felt dragging him through the water? Did she save him? Did she save all of them? The water nymph waits with the men until the ambulances arrive. She walks across the sand going between them. Every few minutes, she dips her toes back in the sea and takes what looks like a deep breath, even though she has no lungs to fill. Then she's back amongst them, offering noiseless comfort. There's an old abandoned house just up from the beach, what looks like the mansion of a former millionaire. In apparent fascination, the nymph keeps going over to examine the ornate fountain in the courtyard. Even in a state of disrepair, the fountain is stunning. She lowers herself gently into the water and disappears under the surface, just as the first ambulance rounds the corner. As the paramedics wrap the foil blanket around the sailor and walk him to the vehicle, he catches the nymph poking her head out of the surface of the fountain's water. He's not the only one to see. Tucked just out of sight near the tree line is a nondescript black sedan with a group of men sitting inside. One of them takes a photograph of the water woman in the fountain, while another talks urgently over the phone. The sailor has barely been in the back of the ambulance for two minutes before one of the men from the car approaches him. The man holds an expensive-looking watch in his hand. Excuse me, sir, does this belong to you? The sailor sits up suspiciously. He's about to open his mouth to refute the man when the needle penetrates his thigh and the amnestic fills his bloodstream. By the time the sailor arrives at the hospital, all his memories of the previous 24 hours have slipped away into the abyss. The containment team is at work in less than six hours, while a group of agents, dressed in scrubs, follow the ambulances to the hospital to ensure all accounts of the ship's crash have been entirely erased. Another team sets to work, cordoning off the beach. A tourist family, excited about their day at the beach, argue with the disguised agents cordoning off the road. I'm sorry, ma'am, but there's nothing we can do. A shark sighting is a shark sighting. We just can't risk it today. Meanwhile, a steady stream of construction vehicles rumbles past, followed by a large Home Depot truck. They all pull up outside the mansion, where a team of agents has the fountain surrounded. Tasers and cattle prods at the ready, they grip their weapons at even the slightest ripple of water. Excavators get to work quickly, drilling at the ground around the fountain and cracking through the paving stones. And before anyone nearby has any clue of what's happening, the fountain has been removed, loaded into the back of the watertight fake Home Depot truck, and has disappeared over the horizon. The water nymph refuses to poke her head out of the water the whole way. The world around her is dark and dry. It shakes and rumbles for hours. The beautiful fountain she'd climbed into just a few hours earlier now feels tiny. There's barely enough water in here for her to swim in a circle. She'd always observed these strange-looking vehicles from a distance, lifting her eyes up above the waves for a few minutes to watch them crawling along the dark roads with their 18 wheels. She'd always wondered what was inside all of them, with their colorful paints and strange names. At least she now has some idea of what Home Depot does. Part of their business model evidently involves kidnapping. To stop the panic rising up too high in her chest, the water nymph focuses on stilling the water in the fountain. All of the bumps and turns in the road, she focuses all her energy on holding all the water in place and keeping it level. If the water around her is still, maybe she won't feel so scared. It isn't really working. But at least her precious little amount of fresh water isn't spilling out all over the watertight inside of the container. She's just about convinced herself that she's used to her cage when it suddenly stops. The rumble sound cuts out, the shaking stops, and voices somewhere outside discuss what to do with her, saying words like, containment protocol, initial testing, and security measures. The water nymph dips her head back below the surface of the water as the rear doors open. She's going to make the most of this, that's what she's decided. 
Having spent all her life underwater, observing the humans from afar, she'd always dreamed of one day meeting one. There had been moments, sure, times when she'd wave at a child on the deck of a ferry or guide a ship through the fog, but up close? Never. They look funny, these people. When you see them up close, they're such strange colors, so fleshy and hairy. It's bizarre not being able to see through them. How are they supposed to swim? These humans in particular are even more strange than the others. Dressed in long white coats, always walking around with clipboards and strange little devices that light up and make sounds when they poke them. She wonders if they get sick of having their legs stuck to the ground all the time. What if they see something interesting floating above them? They can't just swim upwards, they need to get on one of those plain things. This will be fun, getting to meet real people for the first time. She keeps telling herself that because if she doesn't, it all becomes too scary. They haven't put her back in the sea, a river, or even a pool. They've just kept her in her fountain. It sits right in the middle of a brightly lit chamber. Four white walls, a white ceiling, and a white floor. One white door. The lights are always on, the temperature always the same. For days and days, she just sits in her fountain, alone. Occasionally, one of the humans will come in wearing a big rubber suit. They look totally ridiculous. Taking big, slow steps, they'll approach her fountain. The first time, she jumped up out of the water to greet the human, doing her best to wave like she's seen them do to each other. But the human immediately turned around and ran back out of the chamber. So next time, she was slow and gentle, raising both her hands innocently and letting the human approach without doing anything. The human lowered some kind of glass container into the water in her fountain and took some of the water away. He must have been thirsty. She's seen the humans get like that sometimes. How they're not thirsty all the time, she has no clue. It doesn't look like there's a drop of water anywhere in them, except for their eyes. She tries to catch the human's eye as he leaves, but he just walks straight out of her chamber, carrying away the little container of water. But this time, she has an idea. She waits patiently for a few days, waiting for another one of the humans to come and see her. It's hard to tell how much time has passed, because it's always sunny in here, but it must have been a few days by now. Sure enough, the door opens and a human in another big rubber costume comes in. She rises out of the water slowly so as not to scare them and lets her form melt and shift. Feeling her body flow into a different shape, she does her best to copy the human's big rubber suit. She's practiced this for years in the sea, copying the shapes of different humans she sees. The human stops walking and stares at her. She tries to wave again. The human waves back. Success! For almost a minute, they stand there waving at each other. She knows this is longer than most humans would wave at each other, but it's just so exciting she can't help herself. Maybe this will be her first friend. Imagine that, having a human friend. The human takes a hesitant step towards her. This is her chance. Lifting herself up and out of the water, the nymph steps out of her fountain for the first time. She pauses, careful not to spook the human. They do scare very easily, but this time, he stays. Better than that, he takes another step towards her then another until they're within touching distance. She can feel the water beating in her chest, pumping excitedly through her body. The human has another one of those glass containers in its hand. It raises the container up slowly for her to look at. She leans in to see why this strange little creature is showing her a piece of glass. She's seen these a thousand times before in the seas. There's glass and plastic everywhere for her to look at. What's so special about this one? The human takes a swipe at her. The glass container strikes the side of her head and extracts a chunk of water. She staggers away, hands raised in fear. What had she done wrong? Why did the human do that to her? She feels faint, her head swims and not in the usual pleasant way. Her body works hard to redistribute all the water around her body, rebuilding that part of herself in a split second, but it doesn't stop the pain or the sudden wave of tiredness. She stumbles back into the fountain and plunges beneath the surface, letting the water merge with her body again. But the surface of the fountain isn't still. It trembles and shakes as she lies at the bottom in fear. Why had the human done that to her? By the time she has the courage to peek out of the water again, the human is gone. The lights in the ceiling seem brighter than ever. The next day is the first time she really misses the sea. She would race from coast to coast, feeling herself getting dragged along in the ocean gyres as she flowed between continents. She would study the rainbow colors of the Great Barrier Reef before catching a current to Venice or Jamaica. She'd hug the bottom of cruise ships and dance in and out of the propellers on the backs of cargo ships. But here, in her cell, all she can do is swim around her fountain, round and round in circles. That is, until the humans return. 
three of them come into her room, each carrying strange long objects. She's not sure she's seen those things before and is desperate for a closer look, but after what happened with the glass the other day, it doesn't seem like a good idea. She still hasn't worked out what she did wrong there, but clearly the human was not happy with her for some reason. Best to be very gentle with them for the time being, until they're proper friends. The three humans have a box with them, full of water. She's so excited to see it, she leaps straight out of the fountain before realizing she needs to be careful. Patiently as she can, she approaches the box and touches it. The humans nod encouragingly. Her excitement overwhelms her, and she dives right in. It feels so good to have fresh water to explore, even if it's just a small tank. She barely even notices as they close the lid on her and wheel her into a different room. A glass wall lines the edge of this new chamber. Funny little humans in white coats stand behind it, making notes. She climbs out of her little tank and waves at them. It's a smaller room than her normal one. Why have they brought her in here? A slamming noise behind her makes her jump, and she spins around to see the three humans have wheeled away her little tanks on wheels, leaving her alone in the room. She looks around with a little anxiety. There's nowhere to swim in here. Have they made a mistake? She can't be here without water. Doing her best to copy human movements, she tries to mime to the people behind the glass that she needs her water. They don't seem to understand her, just start scribbling even more things on their clipboards. It's warm in here. Warm and dry. This isn't good. In no time at all, she can feel herself drying out. An hour goes by, then another. She's never been out of the water for this long. What are they doing? Don't they understand what she is? Her head starts to feel faint. She slumps down on the floor and turns herself into a ball. Shaped like this, hopefully. She won't be evaporating so fast. Then they'll give her the water back. For hours she sits in a ball, waiting, until mercifully her little tank on wheels returns and she's taken back to her fountain. They do the same to her the next day and the day after that, starving her for hours then returning her to her fountain. They top up the water in it occasionally, but other than that, they don't seem to be doing anything nice for her at all. Are they doing this on purpose? Surely not. She's their friend. She's being kind, doing all of their weird games even when she doesn't want to. Humans aren't cruel, they wouldn't do that to her. But then she finds herself in a different situation entirely. They do the same as they've been doing for the previous few days, wheeling her into the testing chamber and making her stand there on her own. But it's colder today, much colder. She tries to explain to them through the glass, rubbing her shoulders and shivering, but they just keep making their notes. This isn't good. She can't stand the cold. It's not good for her. Painful crystals start forming on the surface of her skin, stabbing into her and solidifying her body. She cries out noiselessly, but the humans keep going until she feels herself losing consciousness. Weeks go by, and with each experiment they do, the water nymph worries more and more that these humans aren't really her friends. They've started giving her mazes, complex plastic structures that she gets forced unceremoniously into, where she has to swim through various pipes and tubes until she can push a button on the other side. At first, she was expecting a prize. Maybe this is why they had her kept here for so long. They needed help solving these puzzles, and their fleshy bodies couldn't fit through the tubes. But nothing happens when she presses the button. They just pull a plug and drain her out of the bottom. Today, she's had enough. When are they going to put her back in the ocean? She's just going to wait here at the start of the maze until they tell her. It's only fair. The water in her chest leaps for joy as a human enters the test chamber and approaches her. She raises out of the water and waves to greet him, just as he lifts the long, strange device in his hand and jabs it into her chest. The electricity shoots all through her body and sets her mind ablaze. It takes all her strength not to burst into a thousand droplets. Convulsing and crying, she falls backwards into the maze. The human brandishes the weapon at her again. She has nowhere to go but into the maze. She solves it in a split second, but as she presses the button, she feels a sinking feeling settling over her. What if they don't want to let her out? It's all her fault. What was she thinking? Her one shot at making friends, and she'd blown it. She sits crying in her fountain, feeling her tears flow into the water around her and back into her body. It was the acid. She hates acid, and always has. She'd swam near a factory once and got a dose of it. It hurt, more than anything she'd ever felt before. It would flow into her chest and sit there, burning and burning. She can still feel it now. So when the humans in the rubber suits had poured some into her fountains, she'd lost her temper, slamming into them with all her force. For months they've been hurting her, jabbing her and exhausting her. But they're her friends, right? And you shouldn't hurt your friends. You definitely shouldn't kill your friends. You shouldn't rip open their rubber suits and 
force yourself down their throats, drowning them in their own bodies. Her fountain's red with blood and burns from the acid. And it's all her fault. What had she done wrong to make them treat her like this? Why couldn't they just be friends? After a few weeks, a group of humans come in and clean up the mess, refilling her fountain with clean water. She doesn't lift her head above the surface. They install a pipe above her fountain that drip feeds water onto her. Drip, drip, drip. And just like that, she's no longer seen as human. Drip, drip, drip. The lights burn white. The door stays closed. Drip, drip, drip. The water nymph sits in her fountain. Drip, drip, drip. After a year, she stops crying. A year after that, she gives up on thinking, too. Three years of near silence pass, with only the sound of dripping water from the pipe, until the door to her chamber opens. Something flutters in her chest. She lifts her head out of the water. A friend? A young man is with a group of friends eating lunch in their college cafeteria. His friends are talking and laughing, but they soon notice that the young man has hardly said a word. He seems distracted by something. Sitting a few tables away is a young woman. She's eating by herself, and in fact, the whole table around her is empty. As he stares, one of the young man's friends leans over and tells him to snap out of it, that the young woman he is staring at is weird and he's better off leaving her alone. The young man doesn't think she looks weird. In fact, he thinks she looks nice. Plus, he's seen her in one of his classes and she doesn't seem strange, just shy. The young man's friends watch as he gets up from his table and goes to sit across from the young woman. She seems surprised when he tells her hi, as if she doesn't know what to say back. The young man tells her that he's seen her in his anatomy class and introduces himself to her, extending a hand. After a brief moment, she returns his handshake. She's seen him in the class too. The two start talking, having one of those awkward first conversations that happen with someone you like. They talk a bit about their class, they both find it very difficult, about their majors, both pre-med, and where they live, he on campus, her off. The young man needs to get going to his next class but he asks if she wants to study together sometime. She seems hesitant, but then agrees to at least exchange phone numbers. The young man walks away from the table with a big smile on his face. That night, the young man is studying in his dorm. His roommate asks him if he wants to come with him to a party, but the young man tells him no, he has a big test coming up and he needs to focus on it. His roommate leaves and he checks his phone for the hundredth time that night. Still no messages. Just as he sets it back on his desk, though, it chimes. There's a text. And it's from her. This stuff is really hard. Do you want to study together? The young man is excited. Of course he wants to study together. Where? Her apartment? Great! The young man doesn't waste any time, grabs his jacket and his books, and heads out. It's starting to snow lightly as he bikes to her apartment, which is a couple miles off campus. He's feeling a little nervous as he locks up his bike and walks to her door. He knocks, and the door opens. There she is, the young woman, looking just as nice as she did in the cafeteria. The young woman shows him into her apartment. She offers him a glass of wine before they sit down and get to studying. In between quizzing each other on the human circulatory system, the two chat, getting to know each other a little better. Eventually, she tells him that she has something she needs to ask him. She wants to know if he thinks she's weird. The young man is taken aback and answers no, not at all. She tells him that she knows it sounds stupid, but when she was younger, the rumor went around her school that she was some kind of witch. She didn't know if maybe someone from her childhood was still spreading that story around. The young man hadn't heard that, but he wanted to know why someone would think that. Because you do dumb stuff when you're a kid, she tells him. You read about a ritual in an old book and try it just for fun. Nothing happens, of course, but don't tell anyone that you tried or you'll never live it down. They look outside, and the snow has really started to fall. It's getting late, too. Does he want to stay the night? The young man would love to. The bike ride back to campus will be much easier in the morning. She tells him to wait just a minute and goes into her bedroom. The young man is nervous. He's never been in this kind of situation before, if it even is a situation at all. He's never had a girlfriend or even kissed a girl before. Could tonight be the night? The bedroom door opens and the young woman comes out with blankets and pillows for the couch. She tells him to make himself comfortable and she'll see him in the morning. The young man is disappointed, but what did he expect? She just wanted someone to study with. It was dumb of him to think that she might like him just because he had a little crush on her. Maybe they'll be great friends, though. The young man lies on the couch and watches the snow fall outside. 
It's so peaceful and quiet here, not like the dorm where someone is always making noise. He watches snowflakes pass by the window as his eyes start to grow heavy, and he drifts to sleep. What was that? The young man jolts up. He could have sworn he heard something. He listens, but now there is only silence. He lies back down and closes his eyes. It must have been a dream. No, there it is again. A popping noise. Then more sounds, snapping and ripping like moist meat squished and torn. What is going on? The young man gets up off the couch and looks around. It sounds like it's coming from the bedroom. Her bedroom. The door is closed, though. There don't appear to be any lights on. But the strange sounds continue. The young man doesn't know what's happening in there, but he feels extremely nervous. He takes a step towards the door and the noises stop. What should he do? Will she be mad if he knocks? But what if something is happening in there? What if she needs his help? He has to risk it. He needs to check that everything is all right. The young man knocks lightly on the door. No response. He knocks a little harder. Hello? Are you okay? Still nothing. Is he really going to do this? His heart is pounding. He grips the doorknob and slowly twists it, cracking the door open ever so slightly. It's dark in her room. A small beam of moonlight coming through the frosty window is the only source of light. He opens the door a bit wider. I hope it's okay if I come in, he says. I heard something and... <gasps> the young man freezes in terror. Lying there on the bed, illuminated by the moonlight, is the girl. But not the whole girl. It's just her body. Her head has been ripped off at the neck. Unfortunately, this student will never get ahead in his anatomy class, because even something as innocent as a study date can turn bad quickly when your partner is the strange and dangerous creature which many refer to as the Penangalan, but is better known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-1060. SCP-1060 is the designation given to the human female, both body and head included, who answers to the name Adila. In interviews with the subject, she has reported her age as being 22 years old, and she is fluent in the Malay language, with some additional proficiency in Malaysian English, which is a form of English that, unsurprisingly, combines elements of British English and Malaysian. The subject has told interviewers that she is trained as an obstetrics nurse, also known as an OB, a type of nurse that specializes in helping to care for women and fetuses during pregnancy, labor, and childbirth. It would seem at first glance that SCP-1060 is a completely normal young woman, and that is true, but only during the day. At night, SCP-1060 undergoes some rather strange changes to her physiology. In the evening, roughly 80 minutes after SCP-1060 has fallen asleep, her head and certain internal organs, including her heart, lungs, liver, and the majority of her digestive system, will physically detach from the rest of her body. This occurs with a sudden jerking motion that rips the head and organs from the body, leaving a large gaping hole in the subject's neck. The now detached head and trailing organs will begin to levitate through a process that has yet to be explained by SCP Foundation researchers. They will begin to float around the room they are in as other physical changes take place. The subject's tongue will increase in size to roughly 22 centimeters in length and will begin flicking at the air much in the same way that a snake does. The subject's upper and lower canine teeth also increase in both size and sharpness, all while the body her head was once firmly affixed to will remain lying in the same position as when the head detached. If there is food present, SCP-1060 will use its dangling intestines as a sort of prehensile limb, lifting the food with its guts up into its mouth where it will tear at it with its razor-sharp teeth. Once it is finished feeding, the disembodied head will dip its exposed organs into a tub of rice wine vinegar. Exposing the organs to the vinegar has an immediate effect, causing them to shrink in size, such that they will then fit into the exposed neck hole on the waiting, headless body and can be stuffed back into the body cavity. The head then appears to seamlessly reattach itself to the body. The tongue and teeth return to their normal size, and no signs remain that the head of this body was just floating around of its own volition moments ago. SCP-1060 claims to have no knowledge that any of this takes place, insisting that she sleeps quite normally. Her complete unawareness of her condition has led her to be very insistent that she be released from Foundation containment, and frequently requests that she be allowed to contact her family members. So far, both of these requests have been denied. A head that rips itself from its own body at night and flies around with its exposed organs dangling beneath it is an extremely unsettling image. 
But this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what makes SCP-1060 truly horrifying. Just as the many Malay legends and myths describe, this creature's favorite foods are children and unborn fetuses carried by pregnant women. The Foundation learned this fact in a particularly unsettling incident, which has been designated SCP-1060.01A. During this incident, a researcher who was in her second trimester of pregnancy entered the containment chamber of SCP-1060 while it was engaged in its nighttime cycle behavior in order to refill the basin of vinegar that would allow it to return to its complete human form. Despite not having previously shown aggressive behavior towards staff, as soon as the researcher entered the chamber, SCP-1060 immediately flew at her. It used its dangling intestines to restrain the researcher, and results were not pretty. Sadly, neither the researcher nor the fetus that she was carrying survived. Following this incident, the containment procedures for SCP-1060 were updated to specify that members of staff who are pregnant or suspect that they may be pregnant are not allowed into the containment chamber during its nighttime cycle. While the origins of SCP-1060 and just how this young woman came to possess these anomalous properties are unknown, there are numerous tales, most originating from Malaysian folklore, that describe a creature that is quite similar. Known as the Panangalan, it is a creature akin to a vampire, though with one key difference. This monster chose to become what it is. Malaysian myths tell of a method some women use to become Panangalan, where they will meditate while taking a ritual bath in vinegar. Their entire body must be submerged except for their head, and through a black magic process, they gain the ability to have their head detached from their body and turn into something that looks quite similar to SCP-1060. Some modern interpretations of the legend describe it not as a choice, but as a curse, or as the result of breaking a demonic pact, but they all have the same result for the woman in question. As SCP researchers continue to look into this bizarre and quite dangerous anomalous entity, she is kept contained in a humanoid observation and detention cell at all times in Site-33. While she is in her complete human form during the day, she is given food from the on-site cafeteria, but during her nighttime phase, she is provided with 0.8 kilograms of human placental material, and she is to have access to a basin that contains at least 4 liters of rice wine vinegar. The lack of knowledge about just what this anomaly is and the threat it poses to certain populations has led to it being classified as Euclid, and though progress has been slow, it is hoped that one day it will be better understood, and perhaps once it is, Adila can finally go home. Everyone in this school knows to step aside when the goth girl is on the move. She strides down the school hallway, confident that no one will challenge her as the undisputed ruler of this high school. It's not just her dark wardrobe or her black nails and eyeliner that intimidate the other students. Her domineering attitude and sharp tongue make her feared. She brushes past a gaggle of underclassmen who wilt under her devastating gaze. Beat it, dorks! She hisses, jerking her head to indicate that they should get out of her way. The other students disperse instantly, afraid the chance really getting an earful. Her terrible reputation means that no one ever makes trouble for the goth girl, but it's more than just her attitude that keeps her on top. It's also all those rumors around her. The rumors started last year, just after a new transfer student arrived in their school. She was a younger classman who shared the goth girl's same dark fashion sense and sensibilities. Students even saw the younger girl occasionally hanging out with the school's resident goth population, but it was no secret that the goth girl didn't like her. Maybe she felt like this younger girl was homing in on her territory or even angling to take her place among the goth crew. Whatever the case, other students couldn't help but notice how the goth girl's lip quivered or her eyes flashed whenever the younger girl tried to worm her way into the goth gang's meetups. Then, one day, the younger girl didn't come home from school. The younger girl's parents reported her missing and organized a whole search party. The police spent weeks tracking down every lead, desperately looking for anything that might tell them what became of the missing girl, but found nothing. Rumors spread around school that the goth girl had something to do with it. After all, hadn't the younger girl been her biggest rival? Hadn't she always hated the younger girl? And if anyone at this school would have had the chutzpah to actually do something sinister, it would be her, right? Despite all the gossip, though, no evidence ever surfaced to link the goth girl to the disappearance. The police even interviewed her several times, but she always denied knowing anything. Yeah, I didn't like that little brat, she said in the police interview. She was always getting underfoot and thinking that she could hang with us. But that doesn't mean I did anything to her. 
I mean, it's not like I would have really wanted to hurt her. The goth girl concluded her statement with a knowing smirk, as if she was pleased with herself for getting away with murder. But you can't build a case out of a smirk. So even if the police suspected anything, they were forced to let her go. Eventually, life at school returned to normal. Other than a few fading missing child posters still fixed to telephone poles around town, most students eventually forgot about their missing classmate. But the goth girl's fearsome reputation persisted. Could she have actually had something to do with that younger girl's mysterious disappearance? Now that other students thought she might have actually killed someone, they naturally found her even more intimidating. The goth girl didn't mind, though. After all, she already thought most of the other students were normie losers anyway, so she liked that they gave her a wide berth. The goth girl walks toward the end of the hallway, pushing open a designated fire exit door and slipping out behind the school. Today, the other goths are hanging out behind the school building. They nod curtly as the goth girl joins them. What's going on, losers? She says, adopting an aura of bored detachment. I was just telling them that there's this haunted game you can download, says the goth boy. It's all messed up. Like, the game knows all your worst secrets, and the more you play, the more it taunts you. Then, when you finish, you just disappear. The other goths snicker at the story. None of them really believe it, but it makes for a fun, spooky tale to help set the atmosphere as the sun sets. But one girl is more skeptical than the rest, to the point that she's almost insulted by how obviously fake this story is. What do you mean you just disappear? Asks the girl. The boy shrugs. I don't know. I just know that no one ever sees them again. I don't believe that at all, says the goth girl. That sounds made up. No, no, says the boy. It's 100% real. It's called the Book of Tamlin. Okay, sure, whatever you say. And who exactly is Tamlin? The boy shrugs. I don't know. Clearly, I haven't played it since I'm still here. The girl rolls her eyes. That's ridiculous. I'll show you right now. She whips her cell phone out of her backpack and starts to thumb through the app store until she sees it. The Book of Tamlin. It's right there in the store. That just makes this whole story seem even sillier. She would expect that if there were a real haunted app. It would only be accessible via the dark web or maybe a strange glitch that randomly installed it into doomed victims' phones. But it's right here for anyone to download. With a skeptical smirk on her face, she punches the button to begin the installation. It's right here in the app store, says the goth girl. Any of you chickens gonna play? The other goths eye each other nervously. Sure, they were all pretty quick to dismiss the ominous story about this weird game before. But now that their friend is challenging them to actually play it, they don't feel quite so confident. The goth girl snorts derisively. She wonders why she bothers hanging out with these posers. They're the closest thing that she has to friends, since so few other students even dare approach her. But what does a bossy prima donna like her really need with friends anyway? She watches as the game loads up the intro screen, and then gameplay begins. She snorts again. The Book of Tamlin appears to be a hidden object game, where the point is to discover various objects hidden in a larger image. This is baby stuff, thinks the goth girl. Find the ten black cats in the cemetery, instructs the game as it pulls up a cartoony image of a graveyard. The goth girl's finger hovers over the screen, and she quickly taps it whenever she spots a black cat crouching behind one of the pixelated tombstones. Is this supposed to be scary? The screen fades, and an empty room with a pair of doors fades in. The goth girl intuits that she's supposed to pick one to advance to the next screen. Rolling her eyes, she selects the door on the left. The next scene looks familiar. Too familiar. It's a bedroom. Her bedroom, in fact. She recognizes the dark decor and the black clothing thrown on the floor. She narrows her eyes suspiciously. Surely that's just a crazy coincidence, right? She eyes the other goths, but they don't give any indication that they were expecting this twist. Are they playing a trick on her? Find the outfits that make your parents ashamed to be seen with you, says the instructions. She grits her teeth. What's the deal with this stupid program insulting her? She knows that her parents don't exactly approve of her fashion choices, but this stupid game can't know that. It's probably just guessing that any young person who plays a game will probably have had quarrels with their parents about the way they dress. That's pretty normal, right? Again, the empty room with the two doors appears. This time, the goth girl chooses the one on the right. The next screen after that is a picture of a pretty garden, and the instructions say to pick out ten pretty flowers. The next is a barnyard, with instructions to find five cows. The goth girl starts to relax. That weird screen with her room must have just been a fluke. Otherwise, this game seems pretty mundane. But the next screen makes the goth girl's face go as white as a sheet. Her eyes bug out of her head, and sweat starts to bead on her forehead. No, 
no way. There's no way that this next screen could be real. The image that appears is familiar to her. It's a real life place. She knows because she's been there. It's an image of a particular ravine deep in the local woods. People sometimes throw old garbage down there, so it's full of old washing machines and wrecked cars. Years ago, an old oak tree fell across the chasm, and now the dead log functions as a makeshift bridge. Sometimes kids dare one another to cross it. The instructions read, find the girl who wanted to be a part of your club. The goth girl doesn't need to search the image to know what she'll find. She knows deep in her heart that the hidden object that she's being instructed to find will be a broken body lying at the bottom of the ditch, half hidden under old blankets and debris. How could this game know? She was so careful. She remembers last school year when that younger girl kept trying to usurp her place in her clique. It made her so mad. But that younger girl seemed to look up to her, to think of her as the leader of the group and the one who she needed to impress in order to be accepted. That was good. The goth girl knew she could use that to her advantage. She told the younger girl to meet her in the woods by the old ravine late at night. Of course, it was nothing sinister. It was just for a little initiation test to prove that the younger girl could take her place as part of their gang. The younger girl was only too excited for her test. The goth girl was waiting at the ravine when her younger rival finally arrived. I came as fast as I could, said the younger girl. What do you need me to do? Listen, I see how you want to hang out with us, said the goth girl. But you have to prove yourself if you want to be part of our group. But you have to understand, us goths, we embrace the darkness. We're not scared of the void. We only take the coolest and the bravest, the kids who aren't afraid of death. So you have to show me that you're willing to look eternity in the eye. All you have to do to join us is to cross this ravine over that log over there. She pointed at the fallen log. The younger girl looked frightened, but she nodded. The goth girl half expected her to turn tail and run home, but she was surprised to see her rival make her way toward the log. Maybe she wasn't as much of a poser as the goth girl thought. The goth girl didn't mean for anything bad to happen. She really only wanted to scare the younger girl. Maybe she could freak her out enough that she wouldn't want to hang out with them anymore and then she wouldn't have to deal with that little pest anymore. The younger girl clambers up atop the log and slowly starts walking across the deep gorge, carefully placing one foot in front of the other. But the peeling bark of the old log is more slippery than it looks, and it's hard to keep her footing in the dark. The younger girl makes it almost halfway across the ravine before she loses her footing. With a yelp, she lurches to the side and falls down the slope, tumbling head over heels and landing amongst the garbage with a sickening crunch. The goth girl screamed in shock. She stared down in the ravine, seeing the younger girl lying still at the bottom, her neck bent at an impossible angle. It was obvious that the fall had killed her instantly. The goth girl knew she was in trouble. Or was she? Nobody knew she was out here. Nobody knew that she'd asked the younger girl to meet her here. All she had to do was keep her mouth shut, and nobody could pin this on her. The plan worked. She worked out her alibi and stuck to it during all the police interviews, never deviating, practicing her story until it sounded natural. The cops fell for it, clearing her as a suspect before moving on in their investigation. For a whole year, she had carried this terrible secret. Of course, it got easier over time. She gradually convinced herself that the whole thing was a terrible accident. It couldn't have been prevented. She had nothing to feel guilty about. And yet, somehow, this game knew. This game knew exactly what she had done. The phone slips from her palsied fingers and drops to the ground. The other goths look at her in confusion. They've never seen their leader in such a state of terror. What could have spooked her so bad? Which of you made this dumb game? She snaps. It must have been one of you. Fess up. We don't know what you're talking about, says the goth boy. I already told you, it's supposed to be haunted and... I don't know what you think you know, but you don't know anything, shouts the goth girl, hysterical in her fear. Has she been found out? Was this entire game just an elaborate ruse to trick her into confessing her guilt? Well, she's not going to fall for it. She's still the queen boss of this school, and if any of these losers think that they can knock her off her perch with a silly game, they're dead wrong. What do you mean we don't know anything? The other goths are murmuring amongst themselves. Of course, they'd heard the rumors about their leader as well, but they never really gave them much credence. She may be a little sharp, but that doesn't make her capable of murder. But the way that this game had freaked her out so much is really beginning to make them wonder. The goth girl is frantic now, seeing her control slip away as the other kids begin to mull the possibilities. She can't believe this. She wonders desperately if someone was there that night to see the whole terrible accident play out. Or maybe she let something slip without knowing. What other explanation could there possibly be? 
Come out of here. Leave me alone. Don't follow me, she yells as she stomps away. The other goths don't make any move to follow, intimidated by the wrath of their leader. But when the goth girl throws open the door to head back inside the school, she's confronted with an unexpected sight. Instead of the long gray hallway lined with lockers that she expected, she instead sees a single empty room. It couldn't be, but it looks exactly like the empty room from the game, the one that she glimpsed between levels. This isn't supposed to be here, she cries. Behind her, the other goths stare in confusion. They too recognize the room from the game, but they can't figure out for the life of them how it's managed to appear in real life. What's going on? Is her guilty mind playing tricks on her? No, that can't be. The reaction of the other goths shows that they see it too. She doesn't think she can trust her senses, but she also feels an overwhelming urge to step into that empty room. Don't go in, calls the goth boy, but it's too late. Internally, her rational mind is screaming at her to stay out, but she can't control her feet. She steps inside, and the door swings closed behind her. The goth boy runs to the door and yanks it open, hoping to help his terrified friend. But beyond the door, he sees nothing but the ordinary hallway that's always been there. The mysterious empty room is nowhere to be seen, and the goth girl has completely vanished with it. Not many people would say that SCP-1590, better known as the Book of Tamlin, is any fun. SCP-1590 is a downloadable app that has been designated as Euclid, and seven copies of the game are currently held by the Foundation in a containment locker for experimentation purposes. Whenever the Foundation discovers new instances of SCP-1590, information technicians initiate an immediate DDoS attack on the hosting server, and an MTF is to be sent in to appropriate all hardware. Any systems that were able to download copies of the game before the DDoS attack should be infected with the COM AMA computer virus to prevent unwitting innocents from playing the game. SCP-1590 is a one kilobyte program or application designed for use with touchscreen hardware such as tablets. Attempts to view SCP-1590's coding reveal only the numbers 1 through 66,666 in numerical order, but on the front end, SCP-1590 plays as a mostly ordinary video game in the hidden object puzzle genre. Like other hidden object puzzle games, the player is given a list of objects that they must find in a scene within an allotted amount of time. What makes SCP-1590 unusual, though? is that as the game progresses, the scenes and hidden objects become more personal to the player, often referencing traumatic or unsettling events from the player's life. It is not known how SCP-1590 is able to gain such intimate knowledge of a player, but since some players report that SCP-1590 seems privy to personal secrets that have never been revealed to another person, it is unlikely that it's just due to very good research on the part of the game's designers. The game always begins with the same dedication screen, containing the message, To Joey, who taught me how to be cool. The dedication continues, listing another name who almost made it out. The second name changes with every playthrough, but is always the name of the previous person to play the game. The dedication screen is followed by an animated cutscene, with a humanoid silhouette standing on the deck of what appears to be an oil tanker. The screen turns bright white, then returns to the oil tanker. A yellow wall, larger than the ship, has been added to the scene. The wall's appearance causes a wave to crash over the ship, waving the humanoid overboard. The screen fills with bubbles, and the words, The Book of Tamlin and Start Game appear overhead on the bubbles. The significance of this animated sequence, as well as the title, The Book of Tamlin, if any, is currently unknown. When a player chooses Start Game, the title screen fades into an image of a cluttered room. The user is presented with a series of tasks, directing them to find objects hidden in the room image. The allotted time to find every object in a scene ranges from 1 to 12 minutes. Once the user finds every object in a scene, a set of doors appear on screen, and the player must choose one to progress in the game. The game continues through a random number of screens, labeled from 7 to 43. Eventually, if the user fails to find all objects in a scene within the time limit, the next scene will be an empty room. The words, you found out everything there is to find about the house, now all you have left to find is the way out, appear on the screen. At this point, the game ends and cannot be replayed by the same user. The actual length of the game appears to vary from player to player, but even players who appear to win the game, always finding all hidden objects within the time limit, will eventually be shown the same end screen and receive the same message. As strange as the game is, what happens next is even stranger. Within 72 hours of completing the game, whether a player has ostensibly won or lost, the player will encounter the final room from the game in real life. 
they will find that some ordinary door, possibly in their home or workplace, no longer leads to the room it should lead to, but instead leads to the empty room from the end of the game. If someone other than the player attempts to pass through the door, they will find themselves not in the empty room from the game, but instead in the room that the door normally leads to. If the player passes through the door, though, they disappear into the empty room. Any tracking devices cease to transmit after the user passes through the doorway. The Foundation currently has no idea who or what is behind SCP-1590 or how the game manages to access users' memories. It's also not clear what purpose the game solves, whether it's intended as a therapy device to help subjects work through hidden trauma or as an instrument of justice to punish wrongdoing. Either way, you might want to make sure you have a clean conscience before you download any new mysterious games for your phone. You never know when you might find yourself confronting the Book of Tamlin. The old house sits, crooked and dilapidated, on the very end of the last street in town. It's the kind of house that children share stories about and warn each other to stay away from. There isn't even any graffiti on it, rare for an abandoned building in this town. But nobody is brave enough to get close to it and risk their life if the rumors of its history are to be believed. A black van containing four men pulls up along the curb outside the house. One of them has been black bagged, zip ties cutting into the skin of his wrists. He was leaving a bar in town when suddenly he found the barrel of a 9mm semi-automatic pistol looking him in the eye, held by a man with every reason to pull the trigger. Two other men had then emerged from the dark behind him. There was a brief feeling of cold metal against his skin as the twin metal barbs of the stun gun were jammed into the man's neck. His body then began to convulse as 50,000 volts of electricity ran through his body, and when he was finally able to open his eyes again, there was only darkness. The back doors of the van swing open, and the unfortunate man is pulled out by two of his captors. The driver joins to help drag the man down the gravel pathway up to the deserted house's front door. In his desperation, he offers any excuse he thinks might save him. Please, I just need a little more time. I can get the money, I swear. I've got another job lined up, honest. I start on Monday, just a little longer, I'm begging you. All he receives is silence as he's taken into the old house. There's no pleading, begging cliché that they haven't heard before. They've learned to just tune it out and get the job done. Click, click, click. The three men turn on their flashlights. The electricity hasn't been on in the uninhabited house for years. It's the domain of rats, roaches, and spiders now. The only evidence of life being the network of spider webs in every corner and the faint chittering sound of… something coming from behind faded wallpaper. The only reason anyone would ever choose to come here is when you needed to do something under the absolute cover of dark, which is exactly what they needed to do. The dark-suited men drop their weeping prisoner to the ground. He tries again to plead with them and receives a hard kick in the gut. It knocks the breath out of the man, and he is left wheezing in quiet pain, no longer able to speak. One of them finally pulls the dark bag from his head. His nose is bleeding, his eyes are equal parts bleary and afraid, like he only half understands his circumstances. What he does understand, though, is that it's looking increasingly unlikely that he'll be leaving this house tonight. The three men look down at the pathetic figure huddled on the floorboards. None of them really want to be here, but this is the job they've been paid to do. They are unaware, though, that they aren't the only ones watching. Somewhere in the dark is someone else who watches them with a detached, almost amused curiosity. Taking in the deep dark of the house, one of the men wonders aloud whether it might be haunted. The man with the gun laughs as he pulls back the hammer on his gun and tells him that there's about to be one more ghost here. But just as he is about to pull the trigger and put an end to their captor's terrified blubbering, he suddenly hears something that gives him pause, something from above them, upstairs. Is he imagining it? Or are those particles of dust floating down from the ceiling, accompanied by the sound of footsteps? All of the men clearly hear it, and the three look around, shining their flashlights into the dark corners of the room. The one holding the man at gunpoint motions to one of the others to go check upstairs. He looks like he'd rather do anything else, but when the man with the gun, who is clearly the one in charge, turns and points his gun at him instead, the man finally concedes that he'll go check it out. He draws a gun of his own from inside his pocket and starts making his way up the creaking stairs to the second floor of the house. The leader's mind is still on whatever's upstairs. His dumb lackey tried filling his head with all those goofy ghost stories, but he knows, deep down, it's probably just a raccoon or something. When his driver has ensured there are no other witnesses, he'll finish the job and they can all get out of this creepy dump. He calls up to the driver and asks him if he sees anything up there. 
Nothing, he calls down. I think we're... His words are cut off by his own sudden scream. There are two gunshots, followed by a loud thump as something heavy hits the ground. The two men, both with guns out, crouch down in defensive poses. They call out again, asking what's happening, but they're only met with cold, unforgiving silence. Everyone is on high alert now. Even the bound man is now more afraid of whatever's upstairs than the men who brought him here. Nobody dares move as, after what feels like minutes of silence, the footsteps resume upstairs again. The leader calls out again, asking what's going on. Still no reply, just more footsteps. They follow the sound across the floor above them to the stairs, then listen as the steps start to creak again. Their eyes drift over where they see nothing. Are they going insane? The two hired guns share a panicked glance as if to say, what do we do now? But neither has an answer. A quiet, reedy whisper suddenly echoes through the stale air of the house. It's what sounds like a female voice, it rasps, What are you doing in my house? The remaining lackey, consumed by panic, begins firing wildly into the dark. The captive and the leader both get as close as they can to the floor as bullets fly through the air, piercing the old wooden walls, causing roaches alike to scatter. Soon enough, the bullets are gone, replaced with only the feeble click, click, click of his dry firing. What is going on in here? he thinks. This place really is haunted. Before another fearful thought can cross his mind, a lamp comes flying at him out of the darkness, shattering into pieces of skin carving ceramic against his face. Next comes a book, then an old heavy phone, and then a dusty old brick that strikes his skull with a monstrous crunch. He drops to his knees, bleeding from both nostrils and the deep gash cut into his forehead, before flopping face down onto the floor. He'll be lucky if he ever wakes up. Only the leader and his prisoner are left now, both confused, both afraid, both seemingly beset by a poltergeist. Suddenly, the leader feels a hot breath on his neck and a whisper right into his ear. You shouldn't have come here, it hisses. He turns, screams, and fires once into the dark. Nothing. A strange, tinny giggle suddenly loops around him. It's everywhere and nowhere. He can hear footsteps, but where are they coming from? They're simultaneously getting further and getting closer. An unseen fist collides with his jaw, harder than he's been hit in a long time. He stumbles, looking around for the assailant, panting like a prize fighter in the championship rounds. But there's nothing there. There's nothing. Crack! It strikes the other side of his face, another giggle from the dark. He spits a tooth out as his mouth bleeds. Not knowing what else to do, he extends his arm and fires desperately. Maybe he'll get lucky, or maybe not. A force wraps itself around his extended arm and pulls on it with a sudden, immense pressure. It snaps before he has the chance to scream, his arm bending at the joint in the wrong direction. He lets out an agonized cry as he drops his gun to the ground, but that scream is cut off when he takes a punch to the solar plexus, sapping the wind from him as he spews out a thin mist of blood that settles onto the shape of a woman's face staring right at him, grinning. His terror and pain overcome him. His mind snaps and he faints from panic, collapsing to the ground in a heap. His jacket opens as invisible fingers work a handkerchief from an inside pocket and wipe the blood from the floating face, leaving only a floating, bloody handkerchief. The man on the ground, the one who was brought here against his will, watches astonished and speechless as the handkerchief flutters down to the ground. All he can do is stare in amazement as the leader's arm flops limply upright, as the gold watch around his wrist unclasps itself and floats into the air and then, with a strange gulping noise, disappears entirely. Footsteps creak across the ground. The front door opens, then closes again, leaving the terrified man in silence, lying on the floor between two bodies. After a time, he finally gains the courage to stand up. He creeps nervously towards the front door and opens it. There's no one outside. Not that he could see whatever assailant just took out the group of men anyway. With one last look back into the dark house, he steps out and closes the door behind him, He's free, and no matter how hard he tries, he will never understand the true nature of the invisible specter that just saved his life. But while none of the men will never know what they encountered that night, the SCP Foundation certainly does, because these are the kind of antics you can expect from SCP-347, also known by the somewhat obvious nickname of the Invisible Woman. But she has another name, her own self-chosen epithet, Claudia. Foundation staff are currently unsure whether this is the real name of the SCP-347 entity or a pseudonymized reference to Claude Rains, the English actor who portrayed Dr. Jack Griffin in the 1933 film The Invisible Man. Of course, 
nothing is really as it seems when it comes to this particular anomaly, though it's easy to be more than what meets the eye when nothing meets the eye at all. Claudia, as I will refer to her both out of respect for her chosen name as well as for the sake of simplicity, is 164 centimeters in height and 55 kilograms in weight. And that's really all that is known for sure about her, because her primary anomalous trait is, of course, that she is completely and utterly invisible. Although she seems to possess them like an average human, all parts of her body, including blood and hair, will remain invisible even if removed from her body. It seems that only saliva and bodily waste become visible when separated from her body, as a number of disgruntled, mop-and-bucket-wielding D-classes are more than aware. Claudia is able to see through what also must be anomalous means, since in typical humans, the cones and rods of the eyes must be visible for them to receive light and thus see. Research is ongoing as to how exactly this is possible, as well as what it could potentially provide for active camouflage technology. By her own description, which due to her skittish and crafty personality must be taken with a grain of salt, Claudia is a mixed-race woman between the ages of 19 and 25, with brown eyes and wavy black hair. She appears to have no anomalous traits other than her invisibility, no super strength or speed, no ability to fly. However, what she does have is a very particular set of skills. Skills that make her a nightmare to anyone wishing to keep her under lock and key. Like, for example, the SCP Foundation. The Foundation quickly learned that Claudia is an accomplished escape and infiltration artist with the lock-picking skills of a veteran thief. She's able to move while making very little noise, which complements her natural stealth advantages perfectly, allowing her to get in and out of secured areas easily. These are skills she's developed not only to survive, but to support certain psychological dependencies she suffers from. While Foundation psychologists have posited a number of mental conditions that could be affecting Claudia, two seem to have risen to prominence, kleptomania and pica. Claudia appears to be compulsively driven to steal as a kind of psychological crutch. Being invisible, naturally, makes her an impeccable thief. However, when she has obtained the item of her desire, said item floating through the air is likely to draw unwanted attention. That is where her second strange habit comes in. Pica is an eating disorder that causes sufferers to consume items that are not food, sometimes damaging themselves in the process. Claudia has developed the unhealthy habit of swallowing some of the smaller items she steals, causing them to seemingly disappear until she later vomits the items back up. When interviewed on the matter, Claudia stated that she'd gotten the idea from watching Stevie Starr perform on a late-night television show. Starr is a Scottish performer known for his ability to swallow and regurgitate items, though Starr's ability doesn't extend far enough to meet the Foundation's threshold for anomalous. Before she was brought into containment, Claudia had a preference for abandoned houses. The home where Foundation agents finally discovered her was one with a long history of reported poltergeist activity. As is standard in instances where spectral phenomena were suspected, the Foundation moved in with infrared cameras, allowing them to quickly detect the humanoid shape of Claudia and move in to intercept her. Without the advantage of her invisibility, she had no chance of either evading or besting trained Foundation operatives in combat. Thankfully, it didn't need to come to that, and after a brief period of deliberation, Claudia gave herself up to the Foundation willingly in exchange for shelter and warm meals, both of which would be provided for her in containment. Prior to this, it's believed that she was effectively homeless for years and had been making ends meet in any way she could. She refuses to discuss her past directly, though a long string of ghost activity across the area and at least two deaths have been solidly linked to her activities. Being unseen for years of her life, has taken an undeniable mental toll on Claudia, the isolation leading to instability and even violent outbursts on occasion. Thankfully, she has responded well to treatment from Foundation counselors and psychiatrists, which has reduced the frequency of these violent outbursts significantly. As she recovers further from her traumatic past, there is hope that Claudia may even begin to recover from her kleptomaniac tendencies altogether, allowing her to live a normal, well-adjusted life, or as much as one can hope to live while still remaining invisible. There's even more good news, though. Since entering containment and undergoing recovery, Claudia has become much more social. She enjoys interacting with other people, especially when they treat her as though she's an average person, and some of her actions have even been described as bordering on flirtatious. She enjoys interacting physically with people, and often plays impish pranks on the unsuspecting people sent into her chamber, such as rearranging or taking items to confuse them. She also shows, for unknown reasons, a particular fondness for interacting with people as they sleep, often touching and stroking them, 
though it may have been one of the only ways she was able to have human contact prior to entering Foundation custody. While she describes this as feeling right, those who experience it from the other side describe it as feeling unnerving, as though they've been touched by a ghost. Naturally, due to being an intelligent escape artist that is impossible to see through conventional means, Foundation containment specialists have needed to go all out on her containment measures, both to keep her contained and to keep her comfortable enough that she has no desire to attempt a containment breach. She is kept in a 5 meter by 5 meter room in Site 17, constantly monitored by a remote infrared camera, and in addition to infrared detection systems, Claudia is also visible in ultraviolet light, expanding the Foundation's means of seeing her. Her room has an ensuite bathroom with a shower and bathtub, and is furnished with a queen-sized bed, several oversized beanbag chairs, two armchairs, a desk and swivel chair, several bookcases, and a TV with a DVD player. The bookcases are filled with various books, primarily adventure novels, harlequin romances, and art books. She is allowed DVDs of various movies and TV shows predating her arrival at the SCP facility, and may request new material to be reviewed every so often. Claudia is given access to any clothes she pleases, though she often prefers to remain unclothed to take advantage of her full invisibility. She does on occasion wear wigs and makeup for her own amusement. Her room must remain locked at all times when she is inside it, and two guards are required to check the door for any signs of tampering every hour. The door is only unlocked to allow staff members in and out of the containment chamber for the purposes of research and enrichment. Claudia enjoys chatting with staff members who bring her food, though said staff members are discouraged from forming attachments that are too close to Claudia, as it may allow her to manipulate them into helping her escape or gain special privileges. On the rare occasions when Claudia is allowed to leave the room, she is mandated to wear gloves and a layer of grease paint over her face to give personnel awareness of her hands and facial expressions. If she does attempt violent action or escape, she must be apprehended immediately and placed back into her room. In the event of an escape, infrared goggles will be distributed to all personnel, and any strange phenomena around Site-17 will be reported. Thankfully, escape attempts are quite infrequent, and while she currently has the Euclid Object class, pending further therapy, her containment class may be upgraded to Safe class. Of course, the Foundation keeps any containment breaches close to the chest, and if there was a recent containment breach, you'd have no way of knowing. For all you know, she could be watching you right now. So sleep tight. And if you feel someone stroking your hair in the night, be sure to check up on your valuables in the morning. A young woman steps onto her bathroom scale. She holds her breath and squeezes her eyes shut, afraid to see the results as she listens to the dial spinning. When it slows to a stop, she opens her eyes and looks down. She balks at the result. 150 pounds? That's unacceptable in her eyes. She steps off the scale and examines her reflection in the full-length mirror. In truth, her weight is far from out of control but when she looks at herself, she can't help but see flaws. The subtle ring of pudge around her middle, the way her butt sticks out just a little too far for her liking, the very faint thickness around her cheeks and chin that hint at her history of snacking. As she leaves the bathroom, she reflects on her situation. Of course she's gaining weight. How could it be any other way? For the last two years, she's been in lockdown during a pandemic, and she's barely left her apartment. She let her gym membership lapse, and instead of cycling to work, She's instead taking the easy way out by just driving, and it's not like she gets much exercise in her free time either. During these last two years of isolation, she's mostly stayed in and watched television. She's discovered a particular love for trashy daytime talk shows and court dramas. Intellectually, she knows that they're the equivalent of junk food, but at the same time, there is a certain mindless charm to them. She would be embarrassed to admit it to any of her friends, but she does enjoy just turning off her brain and absorbing some silly talk show about professional stunt dwarves or Satan-worshipping furry juggalos. That sort of entertainment has been a boon to get her through the tough times. Nevertheless, it's time to make a change. She promises herself that she's going to get into shape. Today, instead of vegging out on the couch, she's going to make an effort. She's going to go out and get some exercise and, she tells herself, she's going to watch those extra pounds melt away right before her eyes. She hopes that her old gym clothes will still fit her. After all, she's definitely put on some extra weight since her last trip to the gym. After rummaging through her drawers, she finds what she's looking for, her spandex gym shorts and sports bra. She quickly changes her clothes and is relieved to see that, although they might be a little snugger than she would like, they still fit her pretty well. That's a good sign. She probably won't even have to work very hard to get herself down to her ideal weight. It's all a matter of willpower, she tells herself. I was fit before, so that means I should be able to do it again. All I have to do is avoid temptation. 
I'll just have to make sure I stay active instead of watching trash TV all day. After all, I don't want to rot my brain too much. On the first day, she actually does an admirable job of sticking to her plan. She cycles to work, enjoying the fresh air and the reassuring post-workout burn in her legs that let her know that she's making progress. She throws away all the junk food in her refrigerator and goes shopping for healthy fruits and vegetables. And, most important of all, she limits her television time. She knows that trashy TV is probably her biggest addiction, even more than junk food, so she needs to be careful of that. On the second day, though, she notices something strange. She starts off with a simple, healthy breakfast, just some granola and a glass of juice. It's barely enough to satisfy her, but she knows that she has to make sacrifices if she expects to actually lose any weight. After breakfast, she decides to go out for a jog. As she's out on the street, she's overcome with sudden hunger. Of course, that's to be expected. She's on a diet now, so it's going to take some time to adjust to these smaller meals. She puts her hand to her rumbling stomach and grimaces. She's never felt this hungry before. If she didn't know better, she would think that she hadn't eaten for a week with the amount of pain that she's feeling. In fact, she's actually starting to feel a little woozy and she has to lean against a light post to keep from fainting. She shakes her head to clear her thoughts. Okay, she thinks, I must have misjudged how many calories I need to get me through a morning. Her eyes stray to a nearby coffee shop. She sighs in relief. She thinks to herself, I'll just pop in there and get myself a small snack, just a little something to keep my blood sugar up. She walks into the cafe and gets in line. As she waits, she can't help but stare at the rows of pastries on display under the glass. They all look delicious, and she is really hungry. She fully intends to only get a bagel with a little smear of cream cheese, but when she gets to the counter, she finds herself ordering way too much food. I'd like two scones, three danishes, and a bear claw, she says. Also a large super raspberry frappuccino with extra syrup and whipped cream. The words just tumble out of her mouth almost as if it's not her saying them, but rather some other voice speaking through her mouth. What the? I didn't say that, she stammers. The clerk behind the counter eyes her strangely, and the young woman feels too embarrassed to protest further. She steps aside and waits for her order, pondering the strange event that just happened. Is she possessed? She's not a superstitious person, but she can't think of any other explanation for what just happened. She can admit to herself that she has broken down and lost to temptation over a tasty snack in the past, but this? This is ridiculous. Eventually, when the clerk hands her the order, she rationalizes the whole thing away. I must just be having a hunger hallucination, she says to herself. Obviously, I need to be a little more careful about not being so strict about my diet. I'm sure if I just eat sensibly, I won't have an experience like that again. Her stomach grumbles again, reminding her of the original reason why she stepped into this coffee shop. She retreats to a table in the corner and tears open the bag. She wolfs down her pastries with gusto and slurps at her rich, creamy drink. When she's finished, she sighs in satisfaction although the uncomfortable full feeling in her belly reminds her of her predicament. She only meant to eat enough to keep her from fainting, but instead she's eating herself silly, and it's only day two of the diet. This does not bode well. Okay, she tells herself, this is my last cheat. From now on, I'm going to be serious about this diet. She stands up and leaves the cafe, ready to complete the rest of her jog. But then, something even stranger happens. On the television, the matriarch of the family is furious. She has forbidden her daughter from marrying the gardener because she believes that he is too low class for her high-born daughter. But what she doesn't realize is that her daughter is in love and that she is determined to make it work. The daughter and the gardener have eloped and the matriarch is hiring a private detective to track them down. Meanwhile, the matriarch's long-lost twin brother, whom she thought died in a plane crash in the tropics, has actually been alive the entire time. He has been in a South American hospital recovering from amnesia, but now, he returns to the family estate, ready to claim his share of the inheritance. These events are all noted by the family's shady lawyer, who has big plans to usurp the family fortune himself. <laughs> Unbeknownst to the family, he is actually secretly working for their mortal enemies and business rivals to destroy them. The young woman laughs, shoving a handful of potato chips into her mouth. Oh man, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes now. That lawyer is playing them all like fiddles. Suddenly, she startles, as if she's just waking up. Where is she? Wasn't she just in that coffee shop? How is it that she's at home? And why is she eating potato chips? She was sure that she threw out all the junk food in the house. She must have bought a bag on her way back home from jogging, but she literally cannot remember it. And what is she doing now? Watching television and eating junk food? In disgust, she grabs the remote and shuts off the TV. She was supposed to be jogging, and instead, she's sitting at home and watching stupid soap operas. The thing that worries her the most is her apparent blackout. 
She remembers nothing about her trip home from the coffee shop, although the evidence of the potato chip bag indicates that she must have stopped at a convenience store or supermarket on the way home. How could she forget something like that? I really must be having a blood sugar issue, she tells herself reassuringly, even though deep down she knows that can't be the case. She had the blackout after eating the pastries at the coffee shop, so that can't be the cause. But she really doesn't want to think about that, so she puts it out of her head with a renewed promise to commit to her exercise and fitness program. Over the next few days, she makes a valiant effort to keep her promise. She cycles when she can, she jogs when she remembers, and yet, the blackouts continue. And no matter where she is when she loses her memory, she always recovers in the same place. Back home on her couch, always in the middle of eating some fatty junk food, always staring at the television set. Sure, she's always had an unhealthy television habit and she knows that trashy talk shows and silly soap operas are her biggest weakness, but it doesn't make any sense that she would be seeking them out when she's in some kind of fugue state, right? As the weeks roll by, the young woman finds that her weight keeps rising. When she steps onto the bathroom scale, she's shocked to see that the dial points to 200 pounds. She's doing everything right, she thinks. How is that possible? How is it possible that she's ballooned up an extra 50 pounds since deciding to slim down? She can't fit into her old gym clothes anymore. She can barely tug the spandex shorts up to her thighs and, even if she could, she's afraid that they're going to split apart. In desperation, she switches to an old stretchy sweatsuit. It's the only thing that she owns that still fits her. This is just a temporary setback, she tells herself as she stares at her bloated reflection in the bathroom mirror. I just have to work harder. And she does. Or does she? When she goes to ride her bike, she finds that it's no longer strong enough to support her weight. She can't perch on the seat comfortably and the steel body frame starts to creak when she rests her full weight upon it. She steals her resolve. Sure, it might be embarrassing to go out in public wearing an ill-fitting sweatsuit and riding a bike groaning under her bulk, but she really has no choice. This time, she's going to do it. And she probably did ride her bike to work, right? She's not sure. The next thing that she knows, she's back at home, spread across the couch, basking in the comforting glow of the television. The floor is covered in empty bags and cartons, and her face is slathered with crumbs and sauce. The last thing that she remembers is that she was just about to go for a bike ride, but now she's back at home and it looks like she just completely ruined her diet. She lifts her arm with some effort and stares at her watch. She's lost almost a whole day. That's the longest blackout yet. She must have gone out cycling and made her way home where she decided to reward herself for her strenuous efforts with a little snack. That's the only logical explanation. She tries to reassure herself that maybe she's past the worst of it, but she finds that these mysterious blackouts keep happening. They happen while she's at work, while she's at the gym, while she's out cycling, but she always comes to in the same place, sitting on her sofa at home, in front of the TV, surrounded by the debris of a massive meal. Again, she wonders if maybe she's having some sort of reaction to her new low-calorie diet. Maybe she's been cutting back so far on her food intake that she's starting to have fainting spells. Maybe her diet food is tainted in some way. But that doesn't explain why she keeps gaining weight. The scale in her bathroom doesn't lie. It keeps reporting higher and higher numbers. And as much as she tries to reassure herself that it must just be broken, her ever-tightening clothes and ever-widening reflection tell her otherwise. Her trips to the gym become less and less frequent as she finds that other patrons have started to stare and whisper about her. Are they laughing at her for not being able to control her weight? Are they whispering about how her new flab is spilling from the confines of her sweatsuit? She can't even run on the treadmill for more than a few minutes without being completely winded, and she's too wide to balance on her bike now. The young woman has grown absolutely massive to the point that she completely fills the whole couch. She chews her way through yet another bag of potato chips, her eyes never straying from the ever-chattering television set. She barely moves from this spot, her tremendous girth sinking into a permanent groove in the cushions as the couch springs groan. She barely notices, however, because she's much too intent on enjoying herself. She loves to eat, and every bite brings her untold joy, her taste buds tingling with delight. She is constantly full, so much so that she feels slightly sick, so bloated that she feels like she might just burst, but she's powerless to resist the siren call of junk food. She scarfs down entire boxes of cookies and cartons of ice cream without a thought, having turned into the very definition of a mindless eater. Only occasionally does she rouse herself from this stupor of gorging, to reach for her telephone, to order more takeout or more grocery delivery, always choosing the most calorie-laden options. Other than eating, her attention is completely devoted to her television set. She watches a constant stream of daytime talk shows, laughing along with the studio audience as the hosts parade out an assortment of society's biggest freaks. Sometimes she'll switch the channel to watch soap operas, becoming so wrapped up in the ridiculous plot twists and melodramatic acting that she completely forgets the passage of time. 
Her bicycle stands propped against the wall in the hallway, completely forgotten and untouched now for months. At this point, all thoughts of losing weight have utterly evaporated, and all that she cares about is satisfying her appetites for junk food and junk television. One day, she suddenly shakes her head and looks down at herself in horror, as if seeing herself for the first time. What the? She says in disbelief. She drops her half-eaten carton of ice cream and grabs at her fleshy middle with her hands, as if to make sure that it's all her and not some kind of crazy dream. Her hands sink deep into her new flesh, and she realizes to her shock that indeed she has eaten herself into morbid obesity. How is this possible? I can't be this big. I was only… only… Her words trail off as the sound of an organ sting from the soap opera on TV diverts her attention. Within seconds, her eyes have glazed over and her hands move to pick up the dropped carton of ice cream. Her worries about her growing size forgotten, she's now only concerned with watching until the next commercial break. It might seem unbelievable that someone could undergo such a startling physical and mental transformation, but what that young woman experienced has led to her being classified by the Foundation as SCP-2611. SCP-2611 is, as you might have expected, a young woman currently weighing approximately 500 pounds. Her mobility is limited due to her weight, although SCP staff encourage her to take light exercise whenever possible in hopes of preventing her mobility from deteriorating further. She also suffers from several health issues related to her weight and lifestyle, including diabetes, for which she is receiving treatment by Foundation personnel. Her awareness of her situation and surroundings is severely limited, as she spends most of her time in a stupor, but when she is lucid, she believes that she is in a special facility receiving treatment for her weight problem. In reality, SCP-2611 is under observation because of SCP-2611-1. SCP-2611-1 is a mass of sentient fat located on SCP-2611's left side. SCP-2611-1 has become integrated with several of SCP-2611's vital organs, making it too dangerous to attempt to remove SCP-2611-1 via liposuction or other means. SCP-2611-1 has gradually exerted increasing control over the mind and actions of its host, to the point that SCP-2611 is only fully conscious for one to two hours daily. The rest of the time, SCP-2611-1 is fully in control of its host's behavior. Prior to coming to the SCP facility, SCP-2611-1 influenced its host to consume massive amounts of calories, leading to the mysterious and sudden weight gain that we observed earlier. This was possibly an attempt by SCP-2611-1 to increase its own size and influence, but as of yet, its reasons, as well as how it exerts control over its host, are unknown. When in control, SCP-2611-1 can speak through its host, communicating in standard American English. SCP-2611's access to food has been limited since her arrival at the Foundation, so as to prevent her weight gain from accelerating to dangerous levels. Other than eating, SCP-2611-1's main interest appears to be daytime television. Attempts to communicate with SCP-2611-1 have so far met with little success due to the anomaly's limited attention span for anything other than the minutiae of daytime television. In a conversation with one researcher, however, SCP-2611-1 let slip that it preferred daytime television to the programming watched by, quote, that other guy, suggesting that it lived inside a different host before it eventually took up residence within the body of SCP-2611. At another point, while in the middle of a conversation about a court drama, SCP-2611-1 suddenly announced, Kill it! Kill it now! I don't care if I die! Staff believe that this might not have been SCP-2611-1 at all, but rather the voice of SCP-2611 trying to break through the hypnotic control of her parasite to call for help. At this time, no drastic action is recommended until further observations can be made. SCP-2611-1 does not appear to be contagious, and the way that it bonds with the host is unknown, so it is currently classified as safe. At the moment, SCP-2611-1 is the only known instance of its kind. However, considering rising levels of obesity worldwide, it is not unfathomable to think that there could be countless other instances influencing the behavior of other hosts to dedicate their lives to consuming food and television. Who knows, it's not like most of us would need that much convincing. Honestly, no. It doesn't feel like anything is working, the woman tells the man who is seated across the room from her. She's been coming to see him for several months now, but she doesn't feel like she's made progress on any of her issues. The man listens and nods as he jots down some notes on his pad of paper. He has something he wants to discuss with her. She may feel as though she's run out of options, 
but there is one other thing they could try. He's seen lots of success using this with his other patients, though it's a technique that many would deem to be rather… unconventional. The woman is unsure. Unconventional techniques don't exactly instill her with confidence. But at this point, what did she have to lose? The man stands up and motions for the woman to follow him. He leads her out of his office to a section of his practice that she's never seen before, where they stop in front of a closed door. On the door is a window covered by a curtain, and she notices that there are a set of strong locks as well. He unlocks the door and ushers her inside, where she finds that it is a small room, maybe ten feet across at most, with thick padding on the floor and walls, and bright white lights set into the ceiling. He tells her to wait there just a moment and to make herself comfortable before he excuses himself. The woman looks around at the padded room, wondering just what it is that she's agreed to. The man returns, and now he's holding something. A garment bag. He unzips it to reveal a dark piece of clothing inside, but when he takes it out, she sees now that it isn't clothing at all, at least not any normal kind. It's a straitjacket. The woman is scared, unsure if she wants to go through with this, and he does his best to put her at ease. If she's uncomfortable, she certainly doesn't have to do anything she doesn't want to, but he reiterates that he has had great results using this with some of his other patients. It's been something of a miracle cure. Well, no, cure is the wrong word. He corrects himself and explains that this won't cure her in the way that she's probably thinking, but rather, what he's found is that this therapy is able to provide a momentary relief from symptoms, a chance to see what life is like without being plagued by the issues that have led her to seek his help. Once she has gotten a glimpse at what life is like without these burdens, they can work towards bringing her back to that point through other therapies and techniques. This might be just the breakthrough she needs to finally make something work. The woman is still skeptical, but she is desperate to find anything that will help her escape the thoughts constantly plaguing her mind so that she can get back to being the person she wants to be and after a moment of thought, she agrees to go through with the procedure. The therapist tells the woman to hold her arms out in front of her and places the straitjacket on her. She can see and feel now that it is made of black leather and it fits her perfectly, almost as if it were made just for her. She turns around and he pulls the straps tight before fastening them in place. The woman, standing in a small padded room and fully constrained by the black leather straitjacket, turns to the man and asks, Now what? Now we wait he tells her, before backing out of the room. A warning, though. Now a warning, she says. This is a one-off procedure, you can only do it once, he tells her before closing the door. She's confused. Is this the procedure? He's locking her in a cell? What is going on? She never should have agreed to this. Her mind starts to race, filling with bad thoughts, and they get even worse when the lights suddenly go out. She starts to panic, breathing heavily in the dark from both fear and from being constricted by the leather straitjacket. She calls out that she has changed her mind, she doesn't want to do this after all. No response. She's serious, she wants to end this right now and leave the room. It isn't working, it's actually making her feel worse. All the fears and anxieties that plague nearly every moment of her life come rushing in at once. Her mind races as she can feel all the telltale signs of a panic attack starting, a million little issues pulling her apart at the seams, leaving her stretched out and helpless to do anything to stop it. But then suddenly, there's a change. Like a cool breeze blowing across her face, the feelings of hopelessness and despair start to dissipate. Her anxieties feel as though they are melting away into the dark, leaving her with only the comforting embrace of the straitjacket. It isn't that she feels happy, necessarily. She simply feels… normal. Content with herself and her situation. It's an incredible feeling, and she basks in the joy of not feeling bad. She doesn't know how long she's in the dark room feeling content. Minutes? maybe hours, but eventually the door opens and the lights come on. Her session is over. She leaves the office with a new perspective on life. Most of the feelings of satisfaction have gone away already, but still she feels renewed, ready to tackle her issues so she can feel what she felt in the straitjacket again, so she can feel normal. By the next day, though, her new lease on life is completely gone, and she is on the phone with the man pleading with him to let her come in immediately and wear the straitjacket again. He warned her, though, that it was a one-off procedure. Too much exposure is dangerous. She needs to focus on other treatments instead. The woman only wants to come wear it for a little bit, though, just a few minutes to feel that way again. He tells her it's impossible, though. She should be happy it was so successful and move on to new techniques. And besides, he's leaving for a conference and won't be back for a week. They can discuss things again when he gets back. It's raining that night as a figure in a dark coat breaks the glass on the front door and reaches through to unlock the door. 
The woman enters the office and hangs her wet jacket on the wall. Her flashlight illuminates the room they had their sessions in. No one is there. She walks deeper into the building and spots the door to the padded room. She passes by and goes even further to a back room that she's never been in before. In the room, against a wall, is a metal trunk. She opens it to find the dark garment bag with the leather straitjacket inside. What do you want me to do again? The young man asks. He was just supposed to be delivering a pizza, and his boss would be angry to learn that he allowed a customer to invite him in. This is my office, she tells him, and I'm working on some new techniques for my patients, but I need to try them out myself first. That makes sense, right? Well, uh, sure, I guess, he responds. But for this particular one, I need some help. It's a secret, though, so I can't get any of my colleagues to help me. But you can help me, right? The young man nervously swallows the soda she's given him and nods in agreement. She explains that all he has to do is help her tighten the straitjacket, close the door, turn off the lights, and listen. In a little while, when she's finished, she'll ask him to come inside and take it off her. That's it. The young man still seems a little wary of the request. What happened to your door? He asks, but she ignores his question and pushes a wad of cash into his hand. The young man shuts the door to the padded cell, and a moment later, the lights go out. The woman is almost immediately taken back to the same mental place she was before. All of the thoughts that constantly repeat in her mind, the ones that she's never able to turn off, suddenly go quiet. She sighs with relief in her dark, safe space. But then, she feels something. Not in her mind, but on her face. A twitch, just a little facial spasm. But then another. There's something wrong. Her face suddenly feels very tight, like it's being stretched. Her eyes grow wide. Her mouth pulls into an unintentional sneer. The young man hears the woman's muffled cries from inside the room and opens the door. But what he sees causes him to emit his own scream before he turns and runs out of the office into the stormy night. What the heck? The man thinks as he looks at the broken window on his office door. He enters to see that the door is still unlocked and that there's glass on the floor inside. He walks inside his office and looks around and doesn't see anything. But in an instant, there's a moment of realization. He runs to the back, to the door to the padded cell. The door to the room is ajar, and he listens. Is that breathing inside? He opens the door to the dark cell and turns on the light. The black leather straitjacket is sitting in the middle of the floor, except it isn't the floor anymore. Now, instead, a stretched layer of skin is spread across the padded room, with the outline of flattened bones visible underneath. The man's mind can't comprehend what it is that he's looking at, but then he sees it. In the far corner of the room is the stretched out face of the woman, her eyelids pulled too tight to blink, leaving her eyes staring up at him. Through a stretched, contorted mouth, she whispers, Help me. Is there anything crueler than an object that is able to treat your mental health issues, yet has some of the most devastating side effects imaginable? In this humble doctor's opinion, no. And today's anomaly is just such an object. Designated SCP-482, it is perhaps better known as the Mentally Mutating Straitjacket. SCP-482 is a black leather straitjacket that is quite similar in appearance and construction to a mass-produced version, though as you'll see, it is completely unique. Although the straitjacket is comparable in size to other medium-sized versions, it is somehow able to fit virtually any and all body types and sizes. A tag inside contains the words, Made in Xiaoyan, hand wash only, no Acerahena powder, in faded text, though neither the city nor Acerahena powder appear to exist in any records that the SCP Foundation has been able to locate. There are no signs of wear on SCP-482, but there are several cuts on the straps that cinch the garment closed, and testing has shown that it is able to be further damaged, though any additional investigations of the extent to which it can be damaged have been suspended due to the lack of viable duplicates. The real anomalous effects of SCP-482 occur when the straitjacket is worn, and the two main effects, which occur one after the other, have been designated as Time Point Alpha and Time Point Beta. Time Point Alpha is used to refer to the initial stage of a subject wearing SCP-482 and can last a varied period of time, though it is most often between one and six hours of wear. During this period, the subject will report feeling mentally better and any negative mental afflictions that they suffer from or are forced to deal with will appear to disappear completely. Additionally, any medications that they may be on will have their effects negated entirely, leading to them returning a result on Foundation standard psychological tests that is consistent with a baseline mentally stable individual. 
The effects of Time Point Alpha are temporary, and once the subject is separated from SCP-482, any mental illnesses they are living with will be seen to return, though they will disappear once more if the straitjacket is worn again. However, the amount of time a subject spends experiencing the effects of Time Point Alpha are cumulative, and given enough time inside of the straitjacket, they will always eventually reach the second stage of SCP-482. Time Point Beta refers to the subsequent time period that passes if a subject is still wearing SCP-482 once Time Point Alpha lapses. During this period, the changes to the subject will no longer be mental, and instead, they will begin to experience physical effects. The exact nature of the physical changes will vary, though they do seem to be related in some way to the subject's own mental health issue, with the degree of the change also seemingly related to the severity of their issue. Through the testing of SCP-482 by Foundation researchers on D-Class personnel, a number of different manifestations of the straitjacket's anomalous effects have been documented, and they're recorded in a file designated Experiment Log SCP-482. In the first test, a male D-Class diagnosed with schizophrenia was placed inside of the leather straitjacket. He immediately reported feeling eerily calm, and he was observed to simply sit and stare at the wall with a blank expression for 2 hours and 49 minutes, a period which was later determined to be his Time Point Alpha. Time Point Beta began one minute later at 2 hours and 50 minutes when the subject's body began to contort, and he remarked that he was in a great deal of pain. Various parts of the subject's body began to increase in mass and size, including his head, as his eyes began to bulge out. He called in agony while attempting to make eye contact with the researchers who were observing through a glass viewing window for 34 minutes until a termination order was given. Subsequent examination of the subject's body revealed that his body mass had increased by roughly 180% due to rapid bone and muscle growth. It's unclear what physical process caused this, though genetic tests showed that his DNA had abnormally shortened telomere strands. The observers also reported they experienced an unnatural feeling that rendered them unable to move in a normal manner while the subject was making eye contact with them. For the second test, another male D-Class, though one who had been diagnosed with a paranoid personality disorder, was placed in the straitjacket. During his alpha exposure, he reported a satisfying quiet in his head, with none of the disembodied voices that normally plagued his thoughts speaking to him. He still appeared content after two hours and was taken out of the suit, though after requesting to be placed back inside, he was allowed to return to wearing SCP-482. After an additional one hour and thirty minutes, though, the beta exposure began. Visible bulges appeared on his neck and shoulders, and after four minutes, he began screaming for someone to stop talking and get out of his head. More bulges appeared on his body, and audio recording equipment in the room picked up mysterious sounds that analysis has revealed to have been as many as seven distinct voices speaking in an unknown language. The termination order was issued 25 minutes later, and a later autopsy revealed that each bulge actually contained a fully formed mouth and voice box. Observing researchers also reported that during the test, they had seen flashes of movement in their peripheral vision subsequent review of the taped footage revealed small shadows appearing and disappearing in the room throughout the test. Next up was a female D-Class who had been diagnosed with hyperphagia, which is a disorder that can cause an extreme increase in appetite and can remove the ability to satiate one's hunger. Upon being placed in SCP-482, she remarked that, for the first time ever, I am actually full. She felt this way for an hour and 58 minutes, after which she began to feel a pain in her abdomen. The D-Class fell into the fetal position as the pain increased, and her limbs were observed to begin retracting into her body, accompanied by loud snapping sounds as presumably the bones started to crack and break. Oh god, it's eating me! Oh god, it hurts! She cried out, and a termination order was immediately issued. The autopsy that followed revealed that the woman's body had somehow formed a second digestive system that had begun to consume her own body mass, and if left unchecked, would have eventually digested it in its entirety. Following this test, the observing researchers reported that they were unable to satisfy their own hunger cravings with normal amounts of food, and several of them actually had to be restrained by security staff in the on-site cafeteria. Luckily, these urges appeared to fade after several days. In the final test, a D-Class personnel with pyromania was placed in SCP-482. Despite the impulse control disorder normally causing them to start fires whenever given the chance, they now ignored all of the flammable materials offered to them by researchers. After one hour and 33 minutes, though, thermometers in the testing room noted a sudden sharp rise in temperature. This was followed by a powerful explosion of heat and flames when the D-Class spontaneously ignited. 
The testing room was completely destroyed, and nearby hallway A13 suffered catastrophic damage. All observing researchers were also lost in the conflagration. SCP-482, though, survived. Surprisingly, the body of the D-Class was also able to be recovered, and though the autopsy was made difficult due to the heat it still exuded, a discovery was made. Inside the body, a new organ was found, one that appeared to be sustaining some type of constant reaction that produced heat, as well as strong magnetic waves, and this organ has been placed in containment for future study. SCP-482 is currently being kept in a containment locker at a secure site, with access restricted to level 2 personnel and above. The maximum time allowed for testing is one hour after mutations manifest, and any test subjects who reach time point beta are to be terminated. Following termination, SCP-482 is to be removed from their body prior to autopsy. The straitjacket is then to be thermally cleansed and all biological traces of the prior subject removed before it is used for testing again. Now I bet you are telling yourself, well this sounds pretty easy to contain, I bet this is a safe class anomaly, and normally I would agree with you. But perhaps you noticed something strange in the experiment log. Did you pay attention to the reports from observing researchers that they too had begun to experience some rather unusual effects simply from watching SCP-482 affect a subject? Did it seem to you as though the mentally mutating straitjacket was somehow projecting the mental illnesses experienced by the subjects onto those observing it? It appears that there may be more to SCP-482 than first meets the eye, and this mystery only deepens when one reads the containment procedures on this anomaly's file and realizes that the person overseeing SCP-482 research is none other than SCP Foundation legend Dr. Bright. Is the actual testing of SCP-482 not actually taking place on the D-Class personnel but on the SCP Foundation researchers, a convoluted experiment designed to discover the true extent of its anomalous effects? When it comes to this Euclid-class anomaly, only Dr. Bright knows for sure. The house is small, but cozy. When the realtor showed it to her, she couldn't help but notice all the flaws. The chipped paint on the door frame, the missing shingles on the roof, the cracks along the kitchen walls, even the dented old mailbox out front. But even with all those imperfections, she can't help but feel this little house is calling to her. It's where she's meant to be this will be a home for her. The woman knows, deep in her heart, that this is what she needs to start over. It's not easy. As she moves her things into the new house, she can't help but think about her failed relationship. Every piece of furniture, every knick-knack, reminds her of her old girlfriend. She unloads a heavy box from the back of her car, but she trips over the curb as she turns toward the house. She falls, and the contents of the box spill all over the sidewalk their old photo albums. She quickly shoves them back into the box, doing her best to avoid looking at them. But one photo, an old vacation snapshot of her and her girlfriend visiting Niagara Falls, catches her eye as it falls out of an album. She bites her lip and wills herself not to tear up as she pushes it back into the box. How can two people who were once so close grow so far apart? The rest of the day passes in a haze. There's lots to do, what with arranging the furniture and calling up all the utilities. By the end of the day, she's exhausted and thankful to fall into bed. As she gradually drifts off to sleep, she muses on her situation. Today was the hardest day, she tells herself. Every day is only going to get easier from here on out. Time heals all wounds. The next day, she rises early. The sun is shining, birds are chirping. As she walks into her new kitchen to brew a pot of coffee, she's overcome with a sudden surge of good feelings. This house has so much potential. She could learn to live here. She could find a new love here. The world is her oyster, and she's ready for anything. Yes, she tells herself, all I needed was a good night's sleep. Now, she feels totally revitalized. A little while later, she hears the mail truck arrive and depart. Looking out the window, she sees that the delivery person has shoved the little aluminum flag into the upright position, indicating that she has mail. She ties her bathrobe around her waist and, still cradling a mug of steaming coffee in her hands, walks to that battered black mailbox at the end of the walkway. That's the first thing that ought to go, she mumbles to herself as she imagines all her plans to redecorate the house. Maybe she'll get one of those fun mailboxes that come in the shape of a wacky animal or a birdhouse. Something different, something eye-catching. Her old girlfriend never let her do anything fun. She pulls open the mailbox and pulls out a stack of envelopes. Still thinking about the possibilities for a new mailbox, 
She quickly shuffles through the letters, scanning the return addresses with little interest. It's mostly junk mail. That's no surprise. She just moved in, so most of her friends don't know her new address yet. But there's one letter at the bottom of the pile that has no return address. Huh, that's weird, she says. It's probably just more junk mail. She knows that some advertisers don't leave return addresses as a way to pique a recipient's interest and trick them into reading their sales pitches. Nevertheless, she's intrigued enough to tear it open. To her surprise, inside is a handwritten letter. Hello, says the letter. I couldn't help but notice you today. I'm really excited to see a new face in the neighborhood. I hope you enjoy your stay here. Maybe we could meet later? See ya. The woman blinks in confusion. This must be a welcome letter from one of her new neighbors, but since it's not signed, she really has no way of knowing which one. It's a little odd, but, well, she's sure that the letter writer must have had good intentions. She pushes the red aluminum flag back into its reclining position, folds the mysterious letter under her arm with her other mail, and retreats back into her new house. Imagine her surprise when, the next day, she finds another letter in her mailbox. Hi again, it says. I saw that you read my letter yesterday. I'm so glad. I was afraid that you wouldn't like me, but now I see that we're going to be great friends. Maybe you'd like to get coffee together sometime? XOXO. P.S. I really like you. Okay, now this is getting a little pushy. That first letter was friendly, if a little awkward, but this one almost sounds like someone is trying to solicit her for a date. She's in no mood for that. Even if she wasn't still hurting from her breakup, she didn't know this mysterious letter writer. Where did they get the nerve to ask her out? Angrily, she crumples up the new letter and throws it directly into the trash. She looks across the hedge, peering into the neighbor's yards. In the yard to her left, a middle-aged man pushes a lawnmower across the grass. In the yard to her right, two old women are gossiping at the fence. She feels suddenly exposed as she realizes that the letters could be coming from anyone in the neighborhood. She hopes that maybe if she ignores it, the message will be clear. She quickly scurries back into her house and slams the door shut. The next morning, she finds another message from her secret admirer together with her other mail. The tone of the letter is more desperate, more wheedling. I saw you throw away my letter yesterday, it says. Why did you do that? Don't you like me? I really thought we would make a great couple. Maybe if you gave me a chance, I could make you so much happier than your ex. The woman doesn't read any farther. She throws the letter to the ground. This is going too far. It was bad enough that a stranger was hitting on her. But now, she knows that her secret admirer is a stalker, too. How else would they know that she threw away their previous letter unless they were watching her as she picked up her mail? And, even more disturbing, how could they possibly know that she had troubles with her ex? She stalks over to the house next door and pounds on the door. When the middle-aged man answers, she confronts him with a letter. Did you write this? What's your problem? She demands as she shoves the paper in his face. I don't know what you're trying to do, but I'm not interested. I want you to keep away from me. I don't know what you're talking about, protests the man, holding up his hands in surrender. I, I didn't write anything. The woman doesn't know if she believes him, but she has to admit that the middle-aged man sounds genuinely confused by her accusations. Maybe he's not the culprit. But when she confronts the neighbor living to the other side, she hears a similar story. Are you sending me these letters because they're actually really creepy? I don't like people watching me, says the woman as she confronts her other neighbor. The old woman just shakes her head. Mercy me, I didn't send you a letter. Why would I do that? I could just come over and talk to you. I don't know why you youngsters are always making up stories about weird letters. The young woman wonders about the old woman's final words when she's eating dinner alone in her kitchen later that night. The way that she complained about young people always making up stories about weird letters makes her wonder if this has happened before. Could it be that other young women have lived in this house before her? And were they victims of the same stalker? But who could this stalker be? It's got to be someone close. She can just feel it. At that moment, she looks up from her meal and gasps in surprise. There, right outside her window, is the black mailbox. It's hovering right at the edge of the window, as if it's shyly peeking in, like a bashful caller afraid of being seen. The young woman blinks and rubs her eyes. When she looks again, the mailbox is gone. She rushes to the door and throws it open. The mailbox is right there, standing at the curb at the end of the footpath, just as it's always been. Are her eyes playing tricks on her? Is the stress of her breakup and the mysterious stalker finally getting to her? The next day, she finds another letter. Her stalker is getting even more unhinged, and the messages are becoming downright crazy. 
The next day, she finds not just one letter in her mailbox, but two. Both messages sound absolutely deranged. Her stalker, and at this point there's no doubt in her mind that a stalker is responsible for these letters, has resorted to threats. Why don't you like me? You better change your attitude if you know what's good for you. You think you're too good for me? What does your ex have that I don't? Maybe you need a real man to really show you the ropes. She crushes the letters in her hands, her face flushing with a combination of fear and rage. Who does this person think that they are? She can't take this pressure much longer. She's ready to report these letters to the police, but she still has no idea who's stalking her. Or does she? She can't help but think about that strange incident the previous night when she thought that she saw the mailbox standing right outside the window. But that's crazy, isn't it? Her mailbox can't be stalking her, can it? If she tries to tell anyone that her mailbox is sending her threatening messages, everyone is just going to think that she's crazy. But soon, things start to get worse, escalating in ways that force the woman to confront that possibility. That night, she's in her kitchen fixing dinner. She turns from the stove to grab some condiments from the pantry. That's when she sees it. The mailbox. It's not outside this time, it's in the next room. It's standing partially hidden behind the door, again as if it's trying not to be seen. She drops her work and rushes out into the living room, hoping to catch the mailbox in the act. But it's gone. She runs to the window and, once again, sees the mailbox standing at the end of the walkway in the exact same spot that it should be. She's certain that she can't be imagining these things, but at the same time, what other explanation could there be? She barely gets any sleep that night, tossing and turning with unpleasant dreams. Several times she startles awake, sitting bolt upright in bed, half convinced that the sinister mailbox might even be in the same room with her, watching her as she sleeps. The next day, the exhausted woman rises early from restless dreams and sits on the front porch, waiting for the mail truck to arrive. When the familiar U.S. Postal Service vehicle pulls up to the curb, she stalks over and confronts the mailman. Come on, hand it over, she demands. It's my mail, give it to me. She's too flustered by this whole absurd scenario to bother being polite, and the mailman is in no mood to argue. This woman looks positively insane, he thinks. Her hair is disheveled, her eyes are ringed with heavy black circles, and she looks like she hasn't had a decent night's sleep in weeks. He has to deal with all kinds of crazy customers every day, and he knows better than to push his luck. He shoves the bundle of letters into her arms and jumps back into his truck. The woman quickly shuffles through the stack of letters, scanning the return addresses and throwing each envelope to the ground behind her when she's satisfied that it's not from her stalker. Just as she thought, none of these letters match the description of the blank envelopes that her stalker uses for his messages. She pulls open the mailbox and looks inside. To her horror, there's already a letter inside. She grabs it and feels the blood drain from her face as she looks at the blank envelope. It's another message from her stalker. Now she knows that he's sending the letters through the mail, but how did he get this letter into the mailbox without her seeing him? She woke up so early this morning, even before the sun was up, and she's been watching the mailbox for hours. It doesn't make sense that any of her neighbors could have planted this message without her knowing, but the only other possible explanation is that the mailbox itself is somehow writing these letters. She stares at the black aluminum box, the dark dented metal suddenly taking on a sinister aspect in the early morning sunlight. Maybe she really is going insane. Maybe she just misses her ex-girlfriend so much that she's imagining all this madness and just projecting her fear of being alone onto this mailbox. No, no, she doesn't believe that at all. She's going to put a stop to this, once and for all. The woman jogs into her garage and returns several moments later with a shovel. She doesn't know whether she's hallucinating or not, but she's had just about enough of this stupid mailbox. She wants it out of her life. Even if it's not stalking her, even if this is all in her mind, it's clear that there's something off about this mailbox, something that's putting her ill at ease. She starts to shovel dirt away from the base of the mailbox post, grunting and sweating with the exertion of her work, but not stopping until the post is loose. She grabs at the thick wooden post and hoists the mailbox, post and all, out of its pit. She drags it across the lawn to her driveway, where, with considerable effort, she manages to shove it into the back seat of her car, ripping the upholstery of the seats and spilling wet dirt all over the floor. She doesn't care about the damage to her car. She just needs to get rid of this mailbox. A chill runs down her spine at the thought of taking a long car ride with that thing behind her. She doesn't trust it at all, and the idea of turning her back on it well, she doesn't know what kind of danger she'll be in. As she climbs into the driver's seat, she adjusts the rearview mirror so that she can keep an eye on the mailbox for the whole trip. To her immense relief, it doesn't move once on the whole car ride, 
even though her nervous eyes keep flicking to the rearview mirror to assuage her fears. She finally arrives at her destination, the city dump. She pulls up to the front gate and honks her horn until the custodian comes out of the guardhouse. She motions for him to remove the mailbox from her back seat, and the panicked expression on her face tells him that he should be quick about it. He's barely pulled the mailbox clear the door when the woman peels away, skidding along the curb and gunning the engine to drive away from the dump and the abandoned mailbox as fast as possible. After a few minutes on the road, she starts to calm down. She breathes a deep sigh of relief, a new sense of calm finally settling over her now that she's removed that awful mailbox from her life. She adjusts the rearview mirror to look at her reflection, wincing at the sight of her haggard eyes and blotchy skin. The stress of the last few days must have been really getting to her, but now she feels like she can finally move on with her life. She manages a tense chuckle at the memory. The whole idea that her mailbox was stalking her seems increasingly absurd the further she drives from the dump, but she can't help but feel much better. But when she turns the corner to arrive at her home street, she sees something that she cannot believe. Her eyes bulge from her head, and her fingers tighten around the steering wheel, her knuckles going white. It can't be. The mailbox is back. The same black aluminum box and wooden post. Of course, after all she's been through, she would recognize it anywhere. It's still there, in her front yard, at the end of the walkway. But she's certain that she just dropped it off the dump, right? There's no way that she could have imagined digging up the mailbox and lugging it all the way to the junkyard. Could it be possible that the mailbox somehow followed her home? Could it be that desperate for her attention and companionship? The woman doesn't say a word. She keeps driving, passing her new home without stopping. She can't deal with this anymore. She glances at the rearview mirror, one last look at the cozy little house where she thought that she could start a new life. But she can't live like this. She keeps driving, and she doesn't look back. On the corner, the mailbox stands still and silent, as if it had never moved and never will. Dealing with a stalker can be a frightening and dangerous situation, but it can be even worse when your stalker isn't even human. That woman never had to see the mailbox again after she left the property, but the SCP Foundation is very familiar with this dangerously obsessive romantic, which it calls SCP-1269. SCP-1269 looks like a perfectly ordinary mailbox situated in front of a perfectly ordinary house somewhere in Massachusetts. It is made of black aluminum, possessing a red flag and a white plastic post. It stands at a third of a meter tall, and the house number of the corresponding property is printed on its side. It is unknown how long SCP-1269 has resided at the property, although dents and bruises on the mailbox chassis indicate that it's probably been there for some time. SCP-1269 remains a perfectly ordinary mailbox when its corresponding house is unoccupied or else occupied by a male resident. But when a woman, aged 23 years old or older, takes up residence on the property, SCP-1269 will start to manifest its anomalous properties. About two weeks after the woman moves into the house, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed romantic letters targeted towards the resident of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown that the letters manifest approximately three seconds after mail delivery. SCP-1269's anomalous properties will manifest only when a single female, 23 years or older, hereafter referred to as the occupant, resides within the same property as SCP-1269. Approximately two weeks after the occupant moves in, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed letters every four days. The contents of the letter are romantic in nature and are targeted towards the occupant of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown the letters manifest approximately three seconds after the occupant's mail has been delivered. At first, letters will manifest once every four days, but SCP-1269 will quickly escalate its obsessive behavior to the point that multiple letters will appear daily. The letters will become more obsessive and less coherent as SCP-1269's stalking behavior intensifies. When not under direct supervision of the house occupant, SCP-1269 will teleport to a location near the occupant and face them as if it's trying to watch them. It will always manifest in an area where it is partially obstructed, such as peeking through a window or behind some shower curtains. Sometimes, when the resident is asleep, SCP-1269 will teleport near the occupant without obstruction. SCP-1269 will not follow the occupant off the property, and all anomalous properties will cease manifesting if the occupant moves out of the house. 
Attempts to remove SCP-1269 from its location have so far been unsuccessful. SCP-1269 will teleport to its original curbside location after one hour of relocation. If attempts are made to replace SCP-1269 with a new mailbox, the mailbox will be teleported away with SCP-1269 appearing in its place. Approximately three hours after the disappearance of the new mailbox, it will reappear in a dumpster several kilometers away. Mailboxes recovered so far have all been found in varying amounts of disrepair within garbage bags and covered in obscene graffiti, as if SCP-1269 has become violently jealous of any other mailbox it sees as trying to replace it. SCP-1269 has also shown similar violent jealousy toward humans that it might believe are vying for the affection of any woman living in its house. In a recent experiment, a D-Class male was moved onto the property with a then-current test occupant, a D-Class female after seven weeks of residence. Interestingly, SCP-1269 ceased its teleporting activity in response to this male presence, but three days later, the D-Class male disappeared from the property, causing SCP-1269 to resume all anomalous behavior. Two weeks later, the body of the missing D-Class male was discovered in the same dumpster where SCP-1269 had previously disposed of rival mailboxes. The property where SCP-1269 is located is to remain under the custody of the Foundation, with one male researcher residing in the house to monitor the behavior of SCP-1269. Because of the dangerous lengths to which it will go to attain the current object of its affection, SCP-1269 has been designated with Object Class Euclid. It's our job to make sure it doesn't menace anyone else. A young woman is spending the morning in town, completing a few errands she's been meaning to get to for a while. She picks up a few items from the supermarket, gets the cracked screen on her smartphone repaired, and decides to treat herself to a Danish from a local bakery. It's a relatively idyllic Tuesday, until she turns the corner into a narrow side street and sees them. It can often be a little disconcerting to suddenly find yourself staring at a crowd that is gathered for seemingly no reason, but something about this one makes her particularly nervous, and she quickly realizes why. Each person in the tightly packed together group is grinning, as if they are all in on a particularly cruel joke about her. At face value, they all seem to be very different people, a collage of ages, races, genders, in different clothes with different styles, and yet they're all walking with perfect synchronicity, one perfectly timed footfall at a time. This is enough to seriously creep her out. Whatever this strange group of people is doing, she wants no part of it. Instead, she turns and heads in the opposite direction, fast walking and stealing discreet but frequent glances over her shoulder. She can't help but notice, even when the crowd exits the small side street, that they remain huddled together, like security guards packed tight around some invisible VIP. And even worse, they seem to be following her trajectory, getting faster, getting closer, still perfectly in sync with one another. How are all these people gaining so fast, she thinks to herself. When she's around a corner and out of sight, she does the sensible thing and breaks into a sprint, eager to put some distance between herself and them. Even though they haven't shown any signs of overt aggression, she can tell on some visceral level that they mean her great harm. She knows if ever they get close enough, within grasping distance, something terrible will happen. She's soon back at her home and locks herself in, bolting the door behind her. She breathes a sigh, but she's not relieved, not really. Maybe she's paranoid, but she feels like she isn't out of the woods just yet. Those eerie smiles, those perfect footsteps, she can't get them out of her mind. She slips into her kitchen and slides a knife out of the block. She tells herself that doing this is a little crazy, but having some kind of weapon in hand makes her feel at least a little bit safer. But whatever the feelings of comfort the knife gives her are shattered when she hears the doorbell ring. She hadn't ordered anything, she wasn't expecting anyone. Who could that be? She hides the knife behind her back and makes her way towards the door. Ding dong, it rings again. Whoever is on the other side is getting impatient. She opens the door slightly, but leaves the chain in place. There's a smiling man in a business suit on the other side. She's racking her brain, trying to remember. Is he one of the people from the crowd? Or is she just imagining things because she's freaked out? She can't tell anymore. She can feel her palm getting sweaty around the knife's handle. The man at the door clears his throat and says, Excuse me, ma'am, I won't take up too much of your time, but I wanted to ask, have you heard the good word? She shakes her head and tells the stranger that she isn't interested in hearing his pitch, but he just keeps smiling and presses on. 
Do you ever feel lonely, dissatisfied, unfulfilled? Don't you ever wish that you could become a part of something bigger than yourself? It'd be a real weight off your shoulders. She's starting to run out of polite ways to deny him when she hears a faint tapping against the nearby glass. The young woman turns her head and looks into her living room. There's a smiling woman standing at the window, rapping on the glass with her knuckles, grinning. The chill sets in immediately. She recognizes that face with absolute certainty. It's one of the people from the crowd, and now she knows for sure that the man at the door is too. But when she turns back to him, all she sees is his hand reaching through the gap in the door for her. She screams and backs away, instinctively slashing the knife at him. Two fingers fall to the floor, but there's no blood, just thick, flesh-colored pus dripping from the two stumps. The hand doesn't even flinch. It keeps reaching, and soon, the gap in the door is crowded with the faces of even more grinning human figures. She turns and runs as the sheer collected momentum of the crowd forces open the door. They spill into the hallway, tumbling over each other, but still smiling. She notices something trailing out of their clothes, long, sinewy ropes that look like they're made of living flesh, wriggling and pumping with each passing second. This whole situation seems to just be getting worse and worse. Thinking quickly, she decides to flee up the stairs. If she gets to her bedroom fast enough, she can lock her door from the inside, open the window, and climb down the trellis into the yard before they can break in. In that moment, it seems like the best course of action, but only because she has no idea just how quickly the crowd can close the distance. In an instant, the crowd is up onto the stairs and following her, extending their grasping hands in unison. Who are these people? Why are they doing this? The questions that flood her mind are soon forced out by the shock of the grinning stranger in the business suit, pulling her into a powerful bear hug. He squeezes hard, and she can feel it in her muscles and bones. She wriggles for her life, but she can't resist his strength. The rest of the crowd reaches for her. She spots those awful fleshy cords again, emerging from the backs of all these terrifying strangers. And now she sees what they're all leading back to, a giant, formless blob of flesh, like some corrupted, unknown organ, a huge, monstrous tumor. It pulses and throbs. Just looking at it makes her want to be sick, and she can feel the most horrible energy coming off of it. Whatever this thing is, it wants her. It's reaching for her. Fight or flight kicks in, and this time flight isn't an option. The stranger in the suit has a good grip on her, in spite of his missing fingers, but she's still got the knife. She can see the cord trailing from his back into the giant flesh blob, and with one decisive strike, she severs it with the kitchen knife. Immediately, the man in the suit lets go of her. Both ends of the cord flop down, spraying more of the flesh-colored pus, but the effect on the man himself is even more drastic. He flails around, making the most horrible guttural gurgling noises she's ever heard. He heaves and vomits out gallons of the pus. It sprays from his eyes and nose like a fire hose. It oozes down and out of his pant legs. His body deflates like a punctured balloon as the awful substance cascades out of him, until all that's left is a wet, vacant sack of skin and clothes, quivering on the floor. But she doesn't have time to dwell on the horrors she's just witnessed. She needs to get out of here, now. She turns and continues running up the stairs as the crowd regroups and begins chasing her. She can hear their perfectly synchronized footsteps sloshing through the liquids of their fallen member. They've barely even slowed down. She keeps running. She just needs to keep running. A number of hands close around her body. Several of them clamp around her wrist, squeezing tight until the knife falls from her hand and clatters to the ground. They've learned already. The crowd rises up and closes around her. No matter how hard she struggles, they won't budge. They just keep huddling in. She can hear the giant, pulsing mass of flesh closing in behind her. She feels one of those long, fleshy cords slithering up her back, its fibrous strands easing their way into her flesh until the connection is made. Her eyes roll up into her head as it pumps the fluid into her body, melting away everything inside and congealing it into the same nightmarish slop that she'd just seen splattering out of the man in the business suit moments ago. Little by little, everything that was once her is hollowed out, filled in, and painted over. Once the transformation is complete, she smiles, just like all the others. But she's not she anymore. She's just another part of it, its newest addition, a replacement for the man in the suit. The crowd leaves shortly after, keeping perfect step, looking for some new friends. At some point, everyone has felt the desire to fit in, but one anomaly takes the desire to join the throng to its ultimate extreme. This is SCP-428, also known as the Crowd. In its purest state, 
SCP-428 is an amorphous mass of flesh connected to a number of human hosts with organic tendrils, similar to umbilical cords. The central mass is obscured by its multiple human hosts, numbering 14 at the present moment, and it is an extremely dangerous entity. Once an individual is assimilated into its mass, they are to be considered lost. Upon assimilation, all of the victim's complex internal structures – bones, musculature, organs, nervous system – are instead replaced by material similar in composition to the amorphous mass that controls them. All that remains is their skin and vague shape, being piloted by the SCP-428 hub. When not actively seeking new victims to assimilate, SCP-428 enters a dormant state, its assimilated victims standing in a circle around the hub, audibly mumbling to one another and swaying gently. SCP-428 and its crowd will enter a hostile state if anyone travels within two meters of it. With surprising speed and ferocity, members of the crowd will try to mob the unfortunate victim in a sudden ambush, bringing them into the proximity of the hub. If they remain in this state for over 10 seconds, a cord will attach to their body and their vital systems will be replaced, and they will be assimilated into the crowd, just like the other victims of SCP-428 were before them. If, however, the victim somehow manages to escape before the process is complete, this will not be the end of their ordeal. Should someone evade its attention, SCP-428 and the crowd will enter a period of active hunting behavior to seek out the escaping victim. Failing that, they will try to assimilate any human wandering into their vicinity. There is no safe way to approach SCP-428 or any of its members under any circumstances. To do so is to court a fate worse than death. When a victim is assimilated, SCP-428 and the crowd will return to a dormant state until another victim presents itself. Foundation studies have determined that SCP-428 seeks to add at least one person to its crowd every month, and if a person is not provided, then it will engage in hunting behavior, putting everyone in the area in grave danger. SCP-428 isn't controlling a gaggle of mindless zombies, though. It is an extremely intelligent hive mind, made all the more frightening by the fact that it absorbs the knowledge, memories, and skills of each of its victims, and can reapply them through any of the others. Because of this, it appears to have incredibly adept knowledge of the human mind and will happily resort to using tactics of psychological manipulation to gain an advantage. Despite being a large crowd, tests have shown that SCP-428 and its assimilated victims can move terrifyingly fast. This is because, due to the very nature of the perfectly attuned hive mind, they can walk or run in perfect synchronicity. To best understand this, picture a centipede skittering at great speed across a wall so many legs, but all sharing a perfectly coordinated nervous system, working together to move the creature with military precision. Even individually, each member of the crowd is a formidable foe. Once they become part of SCP-428, they exhibit greatly increased strength, they show no signs of feeling pain, and also have the ability to quickly heal any injuries. Wounds also do not seem to impede function whatsoever. A member of the crowd getting shot in the leg won't slow it down in the slightest. However, while this creature is incredibly intelligent and dangerous, the same can be said for the SCP Foundation, and in the time since they discovered it, they have ascertained a few weaknesses, even though some of this knowledge came at a heavy cost. Though members of the crowd appear significantly resistant to damage, the SCP-428 hub itself appears to be vulnerable to attack and more than capable of feeling pain. If the hub is damaged in a manner that would cause pain, every member of the crowd is able to feel it often collapsing and writhing around in agony. When the creature collects itself, it will retreat, guarded by its human shields. The Foundation has used this method to corral the creature back into containment during breaches, with the controlled applications of fire or electricity being favorite methods of Foundation security forces. Severing the connection between a member of the crowd and the central hub is also a surefire way to weaken the overall ability of SCP-428. A severed crowd member will immediately collapse, the SCP-428 material inside it liquefying and excreting from every orifice. This may intensify SCP-428's drive to discover a new victim, but it can also be used as a method of population control for the crowd itself. There has been one major incident concerning SCP-428 since its containment at the SCP Foundation, and it acted as a painful reminder to all staff that one should never underestimate the abilities of the anomalies they contain. Evidently, one of the people assimilated by SCP-428 in the past was skilled in the art of lockpicking, as SCP-428 had absorbed this skill. It took apart one of its members' belts and used the pieces to pick the lock of its containment chamber from the inside. It then positioned one of its female victims, crouching just outside the door, 
the cord slithering through the crack in the door behind her. She fell to her knees and began to weep loudly, attracting the attention of a nearby researcher. Naturally, when you hear a distressed person crying, it's human instinct to go investigate and help, and this particular researcher hadn't been briefed on the nature and abilities of SCP-428, which left him completely unprepared for the horrifying fate that awaited him. As he leaned in to comfort the crying woman, the rest of the crowd immediately emerged from the containment chamber's door, mobbing him. One forced its hand over his mouth, stifling his frightened scream as he was pulled in and quickly assimilated. While SCP-428 could pick locks, absorbing a member of SCP Foundation staff, both giving it access to the Foundation site layouts and inner workings as well as a presentable frontman to assuage suspicion, was like getting its fleshy tendrils on a kind of master key. SCP-428 and its crowd, with the assimilated researcher at the head, progressed through the building, avoiding key security checkpoints and absorbing several other researchers and guards along the way. This was a particularly frightening development, as it allowed SCP-428 to further expand both its knowledge of the SCP Foundation and its skills in everything from science to armed and hand-to-hand -hand combat. With every new person it took in, it grew significantly stronger and more dangerous to Foundation personnel. Thankfully, it drew the right kind of attention before it had a chance to escape the containment site proper. A mobile task force was dispatched to contain SCP-428 and the crowd, and force it back into its containment chamber. However, being an extremely persistent creature, this minor setback didn't do anything to quell its desire to escape. Given that several members of its crowd were now ex-Foundation staff members, it tried to leverage this in order to manipulate the people guarding its chamber. This became such a problem that a researcher appended a note to its file, reading, People, these casualties are gone. They are SCP-428 now. No matter what it might say or do, they are not your work colleagues nor your friends anymore. Remember this, it may save your life. SCP-428 and its crowd is currently contained in a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter cell, with walls electrified to 30,000 volts to discourage attempts by members of the crowd to break or climb them. The cell is accessed via an airlock, and entry is restricted to level 3 researchers and below, while escorted by two armed guards in order to eliminate the risk of SCP-428 absorbing a valuable asset to the SCP Foundation and coming into possession of truly catastrophic knowledge and skills as a result. Just imagine the disastrous results if, say, a member of the O5 Council were suddenly a part of SCP-428. Researchers are to remain a minimum of two meters away at all times, and it is mandatory for at least two armed guards to stay posted at the chamber's entrance at all times. SCP-428 is to be given one member of D-Class personnel to assimilate every single month in order to prevent it from engaging in hunting behavior. Due to SCP-428's frightening ability to absorb memories, skills, and intelligence, all D-Classes given to 428 are screened for low intelligence and a lack of valuable skills to ensure that the anomaly isn't being given any new aces up its sleeves. However, continually giving SCP-428 new victims is going to increase its overall size and thus necessitate gradual containment upgrades. The possibility of permanently neutralizing SCP-428 is being explored, but in the meantime, it has been given the Euclid Object class, because of its intelligence, skills, and unpredictability. While the SCP Foundation is all about sacrificing the individual for the greater good, this is one frightening collective that they couldn't endorse becoming a part of. The girl has been sitting in the waiting room for at least 20 minutes now, curled up on a hard plastic chair and staring at an inspirational poster on the wall. Her eyes are bleary and unfocused, with heavy dark circles that indicate she hasn't been sleeping well. She tries to focus her attention on the poster and read the words, but she's having trouble concentrating. She keeps nodding off, only to jerk back to wakefulness when her head starts to sag. This is what life is like for her after weeks of insomnia. She was just about at the end of her rope, certain that this was going to be her life from now on, until she happened to see an ad in the newspaper for a study at a local sleep clinic. She doesn't think much of that sort of thing, but she's desperate for anything that might help her to get a good night's sleep. Eventually, the door opens and a technician calls her into his office. The girl stumbles to her feet and drags herself inside. Thanks for volunteering to be part of our study, says the technician. He's got a friendly smile and a soothing manner that instantly puts her at ease. It's obvious from his bedside manner that he's worked with lots of sleep-deprived patients before. He pulls out a clipboard and starts to make notes on a sheet of paper. We've gone over your application and we think that you would be a really good fit for this project. Thank goodness, thinks the girl. She had just about given up hope after that long wait. She half expected that they would simply tell her that she didn't qualify and 
sent her home to try and figure out how to get over her insomnia by herself. So you've been having trouble sleeping, says the technician. Tell me about that. The girl hunches her shoulders. There's not much to tell. I've had sleep problems for years. I have really bad sleep apnea, so I've always been a rough sleeper. I toss and turn, and I wake up at least several times a night, but it's really gotten bad lately. I can barely even drift off to sleep these last few weeks. The technician nods. That's exactly the kind of problem that we want to look into here, he says. For this study, we're going to monitor you as you sleep and see if we can diagnose this problem. She nods. The technician keeps talking, but she's not listening. She doesn't really care about the details. The important thing is that she's going to finally get a decent night's sleep. The technician leads her to a laboratory, a large room with several simple cots arranged along the walls. Next to each cot, she sees a bank of odd electronic machines. She doesn't immediately know what they're for, but she can guess. She's participated in sleep studies before, in hopes that they might be able to help cure her issues, and they usually connect machines like these to your forehead as you sleep so that they can read your pulse and brain activity. Sorry, it's not the most comfortable arrangement, says the technician, but all you have to do is sleep. There's a bathroom down the hallway if you need to get ready for bed. When you're ready, we'll prepare you for the next step. The girl doesn't care if the cots aren't all that comfortable in the technician's opinion. This might as well be the plushest feather bed to her. After changing into her night clothes and brushing her teeth, the girl returns to the lab. She finds the technician waiting for her, holding what appears to be a perfectly ordinary CPAP machine. The girl, of course, recognizes this device. She's used these things on multiple occasions in her desperation to find a solution to her sleep apnea. They're supposed to help open up the breathing passageways to increase airflow and thus reduce the incidence of sleep apnea, but the girl has never had much luck with them. She frowns. If this study is just testing a new sort of CPAP machine, she doesn't have a lot of faith that it's going to help her much. The technician notices her dismay. I know that you've probably used these before, he says. This is just the first step. We want to see how your sleep cycles react to ordinary treatments before we try anything more radical. Okay, sure. The girl doesn't have the strength to argue. She's bone tired, and she's ready to collapse into bed. Without another word, she takes the CPAP mask from the technician and straps it to her face. She climbs into bed, and the technician attaches the hose to the machine next to the bed. He switches it on, and the machine begins to emit a familiar, comforting hum. The technician attaches several electrodes to the girl's cheeks and forehead. He starts to explain that these will allow him to monitor her sleep cycles and check for any anomalous reactions. She's barely listening at this point. I'll just be monitoring you from the next room, says the technician, pointing to a video camera in the corner of the ceiling. So don't worry about anything. If there are any problems, I'll be watching. The girl barely has the strength to nod her head in response. She's so incredibly tired. Already she's drifting into oblivion. The room is swimming before her eyes, her mind distracted by hypnagogic illusions. The technician's voice sounds like it's a million miles away. She's practically already dreaming. Her eyes close before he even leaves the room. The technician takes his station at his desk, sitting before a bank of video monitors. The grainy gray feed from the security camera shows that the girl is fast asleep in her bunk, her chest rising and falling rhythmically with her breathing. Nothing unusual going on so far. The technician takes a sip from a mug of coffee and prepares for another boring night of watching someone else sleep. Of course, he hopes that the information gleaned from his observations might be of use in helping this girl to solve her sleep problems. And he hopes in turn that might help other people with similar sleep apnea issues as well. But for now, he's just staring at the screen with half-hearted interest. At first, everything is quiet. The CPAP machine seems to be doing the trick, allowing the girl to breathe quietly and sleep peacefully. The technician watches without interest as the girl progresses through the different levels of sleep, the monitors in front of him reflecting the changes in her biorhythms. It isn't until she reaches her second round of REM sleep, the stage in which a sleeper dreams, that something strange happens. Under her eyelids, the girl's pupils quickly flick back and forth, almost as if she's watching a film. This is totally normal behavior, of course, during REM sleep. The technician barely even looks up as the monitors register her transition into this new sleep stage. He's been working at the sleep clinic for long enough that he knows to expect this. He might not have even looked up if his coffee cup hadn't happened to finally run out. When he hefts his empty mug, mumbling to himself in annoyance that now he's going to have to walk all the way across the facility to refill it at the coffee machine in the break room, that's when he finally catches sight of it. It happens so suddenly that at first the technician doesn't believe his eyes. He thinks it must be a glitch in the hardware or possibly that his own eyes are playing tricks on him. He has been drinking a lot of coffee to stay awake after all, but no, 
it's really there. He can see that there is a second person in the room now, a large, dark silhouette standing over the girl as she sleeps. He blinks in surprise. How did someone get into the building, much less the laboratory, without him knowing? The figure is silent and motionless. It hardly seems threatening, but, at the same time, it's hard not to read someone as threatening when they break into your room and stare at you as you sleep. As he watches, the figure starts to change subtly before his eyes. Soon, it's not just a solid blob of shadow. It's coalesced into a human figure, that of a large male humanoid. Its torso bulging with muscles, its arms laced with sinews, but instead of a face, this figure has the gleaming white skull of a horse. It remains standing over the girl. The girl snorts and turns in her sleep, grunting and mumbling. She's acting as if she's caught in an especially troubling nightmare and is struggling to wake up. The creature standing over her does not react to her movements, instead staring down at her with an eerie, unflappable calm. The grainy camera footage makes it hard to make out the details, but the technician is almost certain he can see the tiniest flicker, like the reflection of light in a dilated pupil, in the empty sockets of the mysterious stranger's skull. The skull doesn't react. How could it react, after all? It's just a skull. But its silence, with that rictus grin and empty sockets, only makes it more frightening than if it had reacted. The technician gulps and rises to his feet, his knees shaking. He can't let this go on. He doesn't know what kind of practical joke is going on, but he did promise the girl that he would be responsible for her safety if anything weird happened. More to the point, the presence of this masked stranger might jeopardize the results of the study. He hurries from the office, making a beeline for the laboratory. He doesn't exactly know what he's going to say or do when he confronts this stranger. He just knows that he has to do it. But then, he starts to feel sleepy himself. The closer he gets to the laboratory, the more his own body starts to defy him. His limbs feel rubbery, his eyes feel heavy, and his thoughts start to swim. Despite all the coffee in his system, he also feels himself succumbing to sleep. He's only 50 yards from the door when he finally collapses into a heap on the floor. His eyes remain wide open, staring sightlessly ahead of him, and his mouth gapes like a fish out of water. Whatever he's experiencing, whether it's something that only he can see or something in his mind, his expression reveals only abject terror. Meanwhile, at the exact moment that the technician collapses, the figure standing over the girl in the lab blinks momentarily out of existence, as if somehow reacting to the commotion outside. And when it returns, it isn't alone. A second dark figure has also appeared in the room. It too starts life as an indistinct, only vaguely humanoid shadow, but quickly starts to gain form. This one is different from the first. It's a female body, but the figure's head has a blank face devoid of eyes, mouth, or nose. This second figure ignores the sleeping girl or her strange, stoic, horse-headed observer. Instead, it starts to move, ambling toward the western wall of the room, as if it knows that the comatose technician is directly on the other side. When it reaches the wall, it does not pause. It simply phases through the solid structure, disappearing through the brick and mortar, and reappearing in the hallway beyond. The faceless woman approaches the prone body of the technician. It squats down next to him and puts its hand under his chin, turning his head so that it can stare into his eyes, or stare as effectively as possible when it doesn't have any eyes of its own. After a few moments of silent contemplation, the faceless creature places its hand against the technician's forehead. Slowly, its hand starts to move through his head, reaching deep into his skull as if its hand was as insubstantial as a ghost. Just as this mysterious nightmare creature was able to phase through the wall, it appears to be able to phase through flesh as well. After several moments, the faceless woman withdraws its hand and drops the technician's head. He slumps to the ground in response. The faceless woman stands up, and then… it vanishes instantly. At the exact same time, the girl in the other room snorts and stirs. She blinks her eyes open. For a moment, she doesn't remember where she is. Her eyes scan the unfamiliar room for several seconds before she recalls that she was participating in a sleep study. That's right, she was trying to find out if she could find any help for her sleep apnea. Ironically, she actually slept better than normal. As she removes the CPAP mask, she wonders if maybe she ought to see about buying one of these for herself. This particular model seems to work better than the one she's tried in the past. She stretches and sits up. Just then, the technician bursts into the room. He's panicked and out of breath, and he whips his head back and forth in search of the mysterious horse-headed stranger. But there's no sign of the creature now. Just like the faceless woman, it seems to have vanished without a trace. The girl stares at him in confusion. Why is he so upset? She has no clue about what happened while she was asleep. 
Did you see it? Says the technician breathlessly. The creature. The shadow creature. The girl raises a skeptical eyebrow. What are you talking about? She says. I just woke up. The technician starts to sputter out an explanation, but the girl just rolls her eyes. She came here to get help with her sleep, but it sounds like the technician is the one who's got a real problem. His breathless descriptions of a horse-headed monster and a faceless woman clearly sound like bad dreams to her. You would think that a guy running a sleep study wouldn't be so easily confused like that. She's pretty sure that he probably just fell asleep at his station, and now he's embarrassed to admit that he just had a bad dream. Little do either of them know that although they won't see the strange entities again, those creatures are always going to be very, very close to them going forward. What a nightmare. But what seems like just a bad dream is, in fact, an anomaly well known to the SCP Foundation. It's formally been designated as SCP-3060, but agents more often refer to it as the Dream Machine. Instances of SCP-3060 are small medical devices that superficially resemble continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP machines. The individual materials that compose SCP-3060 instances are non-anomalous and operate in the same way as a typical CPAP machine of its size and make. The Foundation currently has five instances of SCP-3060 in its custody. SCP-3060's anomalous effects become apparent when worn by a sleeping human. When an individual wearing an instance of SCP-3060 enters their second REM cycle, a humanoid incorporeal entity, hereafter referred to as SCP-3060-A, will appear within a 5-meter radius of the individual and stand over them until they wake up. At this point, SCP-3060-A will disappear, and the individual wearing SCP-3060 will become infected. From that point on, regardless as to whether the individual wears SCP-3060, the same SCP-3060-A entity will appear when they enter their second REM cycle each night and remain watching over them until awakening. While instances of SCP-3060-A appear as featureless silhouettes upon their first manifestation, they quickly take on a unique shape based on each infected individual. SCP-3060-A entities have no standard appearance, and it is not clear what factors determine the final form of any individual SCP-3060-A. Since the manifestations are connected with REM sleep, agency researchers speculate that an SCP-3060-A's appearance may be influenced by an infected sleeper's dreams. So far, observed SCP-3060-A's have included a human infant composed entirely of fused teeth an eyeless elderly woman dressed in dark clothes, a partially disintegrated humanoid composed of ash and dressed in red lingerie, a naked humanoid covered in tire tracks and showing signs of severe crush injuries, a humanoid whose torso consisted of a large mouth, and a clown. Some researchers have noted that the initial shadowy appearances of SCP-3060-A recall descriptions of entities reported during bouts of sleep paralysis, but so far, no conclusive link has been found. While an SCP-3060-A instance is present, any person standing within a 50-meter radius of the infected sleeper will enter a catatonic state. At this point, an additional instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. The additional SCP-3060-A entity will then approach the catatonic subject, phasing through solid matter if the subject is in a separate room. Upon arriving at the subject, the new SCP-3060-A instance will phase its hand through the subject's skull and then vanish, causing the subject to fall asleep immediately. All subjects touched by the SCP-3060-A entity in this manner will become new instances of SCP-3060 infected upon awakening. Awakening an infected sleeper will cause the attending SCP-3060-A to immediately vanish and catatonic subjects to regain movement. All attempts to communicate with SCP-3060-A instances have thus far been unsuccessful. People infected by SCP-3060 will inevitably suffer long-term health effects, most often associated with severe sleep deprivation. After three days, infected individuals begin to display fatigue, mood changes, impaired performance, and memory problems, all of which are so severe that even obtaining a full night's sleep does little to dent their impact. Infected individuals often report frequent nightmares, though no central themes or correlations have been observed in the content of these dreams, nor do they seem to correspond with the appearance of the infected persons attending SCP-3060-A. Within a month, infected individuals will start having visual and auditory hallucinations, as well as delusions that their mind is being controlled by some outside force. 
Soon after, infected individuals descend into full psychosis as they become unable to distinguish the content of their dreams from reality. In extreme cases, after at least two months of infection, hair loss, Ganidi subita, partial or complete blindness, somatic complaints, cataplexy, and alien limb syndrome have been observed. Attempts by medical staff to alleviate these conditions in the long term have thus far been met with failure, although sleep deprivation has ironically proven effective in temporarily delaying the onset of more severe symptoms. If no human subjects entered the area of an SCP-3060 infected individual's effect during REM sleep for seven consecutive days, or the infected individual dies, an instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. The SCP-3060-A entity will then proceed to search for the nearest sleeping human. Upon locating a sleeper, SCP-3060-A will stand over them until they enter their next REM sleep cycle, at which point, the SCP-3060-A entity will reach into their skull and vanish. At this point, the sleeping individual will become infected. If the sleeping individual wakes up before the process is complete, or if SCP-3060-A cannot locate a suitable subject within three hours, it will vanish without spreading the SCP-3060 infection. In one experiment, an infected individual was placed in a standard humanoid containment cell. Four D-class personnel were placed in adjoining cells. When the infected individual fell asleep and entered their second REM cycle, an SCP-3060-A entity appeared with predictable results. The first SCP-3060-A to appear resembled a headless humanoid with its arms and legs replaced by spinal columns. It stood above the infected sleeper, watching without movement, even as four additional instances of SCP-3060-A manifested inside the cell. All five SCP-3060-A instances stood in silent observation of the infected sleeper for approximately five minutes. By this point, all four D-class personnel in adjoining cells had gone into catatonic states, seeing as they were within the 50-square-meter blast zone established by the initial SCP-3060-A. Each D-class personnel who was awake at the time of manifestation was observed to have frozen with expressions of extreme distress on their face. The four additional SCP-3060-A instances then began to disperse, each one moving toward a different D-class personnel cell, phasing through solid matter as necessary to reach the intended target. Each additional SCP-3060-A instance completed its manifestation by reaching into the skull of its target and then subsequently assuming a definite, final form before vanishing. The four additional SCP-3060-As, respectively, took on the appearance of a male human with mathematical symbols in place of facial features, a humanoid composed of tightly wound thread, a featureless white humanoid dressed in a foundation lab coat, and a featureless black humanoid dressed in a hodgepodge of regalia from different authoritarian regimes. The initial SCP-3060-A continued to stand in silent observation of the original infected sleeper after the other instances vanished, remaining so for the rest of the night until she woke up. Since SCP-3060 has not been found to differ in any way from a normal CPAP machine, SCP agents currently know very little about how SCP-3060 can cause these manifestations, who is manufacturing SCP-3060, or for what purpose. At this time, the only advice that SCP researchers can offer is this. If you're having trouble sleeping and want to make use of a CPAP machine, make sure you're buying a name brand. Otherwise, you might just be opening yourself up to a world of nightmares, insomnia, and silent but all too present nocturnal visitors. The full moon hangs heavy in the night sky over the dense jungle canopy. Below, the darkened palm trees stand silent in the humid air, festooned with vines and lianas, and tropical insects hum in the undergrowth. The night is quiet and dark here, far from the city, in one of the farthest, most secluded provinces of the Philippines. One would hardly expect anyone to be out at this time of night. The young woman is hurrying home, carrying a lantern before her face so that she can see where she's going in the pitch black of the night. Her swollen belly reveals that she's at least several months pregnant, her new middle throwing her off balance just enough that she has to be careful not to stumble. A woman in her condition, she thinks, shouldn't be out at this time of night and certainly shouldn't have to do household chores like this. But the work has to get done, no matter what. She carries a basket of wet laundry under her other arm. She is returning from washing her clothes in the river and, if she had planned things out better, she would have been home long before the moon rose. Unfortunately, she spent far too much time gossiping with several other village women before getting to work on scrubbing her filthy clothes against the rocks. Luckily, it's not too far from the river back to her home in the village. 
The worst thing that might happen, she reminds herself, is that she might lose her footing in the dark and trip over a rock or a root. There's no chance that she might run afoul of some nocturnal animal, she tells herself, even though the sudden chills down her spine and sweat dripping from her brow reveals the truth, that she doesn't believe that at all, and, in fact, she's getting more and more nervous as she staggers through the dark. It isn't just the threat of wild animals. She remembers the stories that her mother told her when she was a little girl, all about sinister supernatural monsters that live in these woods. Of course, those are just stories invented to scare children, she tells herself. She's a grown woman now, about to have a child of her own. She shouldn't be worried about boogeymen. She just needs to keep her head on her shoulders, and she'll be sure to arrive home safely. The lantern throws its light over a figure standing below the crook of a catmon tree. The woman jolts, nearly dropping her laundry. She gulps back a scream as she realizes that what she sees isn't a wild animal, but rather a person. Oh, sorry, says the young woman, her voice shaking a little. I didn't think anyone else was still out this late. I thought you were a wild animal. Don't you worry, little one, says the figure in a soft, sibilant voice. The figure steps forward, and the young woman recognizes her. It's an old woman from the village, her back hunched, and her long white hair falling over her shoulders in a messy tangle. The young woman feels inexplicably nervous running into this particular villager here in the jungle at night. Many of the village kids whisper that she's actually a witch who has all kinds of weird supernatural powers. Even some of the village elders are afraid to cross her, for fear of getting cursed. Where are you going at this hour? Someone in your condition shouldn't exert yourself so much. I'm just heading home, says the young woman, hefting the basket of laundry for emphasis. It's dangerous to be out so late alone. Here, let me walk home with you. There's safety in numbers, you know. Th thank you. The young woman almost wants to protest that she doesn't need any help getting home, because she really does not want to spend any more time with this old woman. But at the same time, she is reluctant to say anything that might insult her. After all, even if the young woman doesn't believe in witchcraft, it's not like she wants to take any chances. Besides, the truth is that she is rather frightened of being alone in the dark, and any company is better than nothing, even if it's this strange old woman. How far along are you, honey? says the old woman, placing a hand against the surface of the young woman's protruding belly. The young woman grimaces. She doesn't like this old woman intruding on her personal space like this. The old woman's hands are wrinkled and veiny, flecked with liver spots, and her fingers topped with gnarled talons. The young woman wants to cry out at the sight of them, but she bites her tongue. Instead, she answers the old woman's probing question as calmly and politely as she can. Very nice, very nice says the old woman, her roomy eyes never straying from the young woman's belly, and her hands still rubbing against her stomach as if she's trying to reach something within. The old woman makes a strange sound in her throat, like she's smacking her lips in hunger, but it's hard to see anything in the dark. The young woman can only nod in confusion, but she quickens her pace. She hopes that she can get home soon, and once she's home, she can get away from her unfortunate travel companion. The old woman keeps pace, grabbing her younger traveling companion by the arm and holding tight. Her grip is surprisingly firm for such a seemingly frail old woman, and the young woman again wonders if maybe there's something supernatural about this ominous crone. She wants to pull her arm away, but the old woman's long claws pinch cruelly into her flesh. It's as if the old woman is silently warning her, don't pull away, I'm too strong for you to escape. What a sweet little bundle of joy you carry there says the old woman, as if speaking to herself. What a delectable little burden. The young woman knows that she's still talking about her unborn baby, but all this mumbling just makes her more worried. They continue walking, the young woman staring resolutely at the small circle of illumination thrown by her lantern onto the path ahead, doing everything in her power to not look at the old woman standing at her side for fear that she might scream. Why is she so nervous? Worse, does the old woman sense her fear? The young woman has heard that witches are easily offended, and that's the last thing that she needs now. She continues walking, the old woman gibbering and whispering in her ear, plying her with odd questions about her pregnancy. Eating well, have you? You know, it's very important to eat right when you're carrying, so that the baby can be born strong and healthy. Right, says the young woman. She really doesn't need this unsolicited advice. She heaves an audible sigh of relief as the village comes into view over the next bluff. Thank God, she thinks, I'm almost home. She just hopes that the old woman will take a hint and leave her alone once they arrive at her doorstep. She wonders if this old woman might try to come into her home or 
maybe steer her towards some other destination. But what can she do? All she can do is keep walking home and hope for the best. Is it just you, is it? Is the father in the picture, hmm? I haven't seen you with any young men lately, have I? Asks the old woman. Her nosiness is really starting to irritate the young woman, enough that she almost forgets her fear. No, it's just me, says the young woman automatically. She immediately regrets that confession. What is this old woman planning? Is she up to some mischief? Now she knows that the young woman lives alone, and there won't be anyone around to see whatever this crone is planning. Her grip tightens on the young woman's arm as if to warn her again. The village is quiet and dark. Everyone else has already gone to bed by now, so the pair of them walk down narrow, still streets. The only sound is the crunch, crunch, crunch of gravel under their feet. After what seems like an eternity, they arrive at the front gate of the young woman's house. Well, here I am, she says, a little too loudly and firmly to be completely casual. This is my home. Thanks for keeping me company on my way home. To her immense relief, the old woman lets go of her arm. The young woman immediately pulls away, rubbing the deep bruises left by the old woman's gnarled talons. Think nothing of it, my dear. The old woman smiles widely, a long rope of saliva dribbling from her slack lips. Her teeth look jagged and misshapen. It's hard to see in the dark, but they look more like the teeth of a wild beast than a human. It must be your eyes playing tricks on her in the dim light, though. The young woman can't help but recoil in disgust, but luckily her face is hidden in shadows, so the old woman doesn't seem to notice. I'm happy to help. I hope to see you again very soon. The young woman doesn't wait any longer. Even before the old woman turns to leave, the young woman scampers across her yard and yanks open her door. She runs inside and pulls the door shut behind her. Her heart is racing, and her breath comes in ragged pants. She can feel the baby in her belly kick, suddenly agitated by its mother's fear. Shh, it's okay, she coos softly, patting her stomach and hoping that her tender voice will help to calm her baby. I know you're scared. I'm scared too. That old woman frightened me half to death. They say that she's a witch and I'd almost believe it. What a strange experience. She pulls the curtain aside and peeps out the window. The old woman is gone. The young woman looks up and down the street but sees no sign of her traveling companion. She inhales deeply and feels the tension drain from her body as she lets her breath out. Thank goodness that's all over. She can't explain why this whole night has unnerved her so much, but there was just something so uncanny about that strange old woman. She's glad to be rid of her. The young woman tries to put the whole experience out of her head as she prepares for bed. As she pulls on her nightclothes, she startles when she hears something heavy and loud clatter across the roof. It's not unusual for roof rats or other nocturnal animals to scurry across the roof at night, but this sounds louder than usual. It's probably nothing, she tells herself as she climbs into bed. I'm still just upset about meeting that old woman on my way home from the river. That whole thing must have jangled my nerves worse than I thought if I'm flinching at every little sound. I'll be fine when it's light out. The sooner I get to sleep, the sooner it'll be morning. Even though her nerves are rattled, she is quite tired after a long day, and it doesn't take long before she drifts off to sleep. The young woman's eyes close, and her breathing becomes slow and steady, the shallow rhythms of sleep. Inside her head, she might be troubled by strange dreams, but to any outside observer, she is dead to the world. Asleep in bed, she doesn't react to the clattering on the roof. Whatever is up there is making an awful racket as it drags itself over the roof tiles. If someone were around to watch, they would see that whatever is on the roof is no rat. It's a darkened figure, almost big enough to be human, but strangely truncated. Two massive leathery wings unfurl behind it, extended to help the strange creature maintain its balance upon the roof. It drags itself forward using only its hands, long talons tapping at the roof shingles as it seeks a loose tile, anything that will give it access to the house below. Its finger finds a crack. Wheezing and panting, the creature leans forward, putting its eye to the crack to peer into the room below. The young woman is asleep in bed directly below, and that's exactly what this creature was hoping for. The young woman mumbles in her sleep, her mind filled with disturbing dreams. She's oblivious when, all of a sudden, something drops through that crack in the ceiling. It's long and slippery and covered in thick, wet mucus. It looks for all the world like a tongue, but it's far too long to be any human tongue. It drops lower and lower into the room, extending closer and closer to the young woman sleeping in her bed. The disgusting appendage caresses her face, leaving a wet slug trail of saliva across her forehead, as if it's looking for something, then brushes against her lips, and the tongue seems to find what it wants. 
Instantly, it snakes into her open mouth and shoots down her throat. The young woman starts to sputter and choke, her limbs thrashing and flailing, but still, she is held fast in the grip of sleep. Some wild nightmare is playing out in her head. Perhaps she fantasizes that she is drowning in a river or choking on some food or being strangled by a fiend. Whatever she's thinking, it couldn't be further from the truth that an alien tongue has jammed itself down her throat. The tongue pushes deeper and deeper inside her until it makes contact with her womb. A trained anatomist might balk at the idea that the tongue could find her womb by accessing her throat, but somehow it has done exactly this, snaking its way through the labyrinth of her insides to find her unborn baby. A sticky aperture opens up at the tip of the tongue, revealing that the tongue is hollow, like a massive soda straw. It sucks up the baby like a vacuum, slurping it up, 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 and out, the bulge of its prey traveling up the length of the tongue like a wild pig swallowed by a boa constrictor. Once the baby is gone, the tongue slides out of the woman's mouth and retracts back toward the ceiling, disappearing back through the subtle crack. There's a clatter on the roof again, followed by the soft flutter of leathery wings. The young woman settles back into a deep, still sleep, the awful sensation of suffocation having passed. The rest of the night is peaceful and quiet, but when she awakens the next morning, she finds that the nightmare isn't over. She wakes with a strange, empty feeling in her guts. Something is very wrong. She throws aside her covers and stares at herself in shock. Her baby is gone. Her rounded belly has deflated back to its pre-pregnancy state, and she can sense, as only a mother can, that she is no longer carrying something within her. She shrieks in terror at this bizarre revelation. What could have happened? What could be responsible? That young woman just had an encounter with SCP-5201. SCP-5201 is a humanoid subspecies native to the Philippines, dubbed Homo sapiens visceralis, but known by many local names across the Philippine Islands, including the Oswang, the Tik Tik, or simply the Viscera Sucker. But it is most commonly known as the Mananangal. During the day, an instance of SCP-5201 looks like an ordinary human. At a glance, there is no way to immediately distinguish an instance of SCP-5201 from a regular member of Homo sapiens. However, Foundation researchers have found that there do exist certain retinal irregularities unique to SCP-5201, so the agency has developed a portable retinal scanner for use in quickly identifying instances of SCP-5201. SCP-5201 is far easier to tell from an ordinary human at night when it undergoes a strange and startling metamorphosis. It unfolds a pair of membranous wings resembling those of a bat from its back. Even more startling, its torso splits in two. Its upper torso then flies off in search of prey, while its lower torso is hidden in a secure location until SCP-5201 can reconnect. SCP-5201 will seek out human prey, most likely relying on a keenly attuned sense of smell, and, once it has chosen a victim, will alight on the roof of their home and then snake its preternaturally long, tube-like tongue into the house below so that it can feed. SCP-5201 feeds by inserting its tongue into the orifices of unfortunate sleepers and sucking out their internal organs as easily as you would suck soda through a straw. SCP-5201 will happily eat human livers, stomachs, and intestines, but its favorite food is unborn fetuses. So much so that instances of SCP-5201 disguised in their human form can often be recognized by their tendency to drool at the sight of pregnant women. SCP-5201 are well known to local humans who live in fear of nocturnal attacks by the dreaded Mananangal. Interestingly, SCP-5201 can be repelled by Abrahamic holy objects like rosary beads or crucifixes, or can be staked through the heart with sharpened shafts of bamboo, very similar to the means used against vampires in Western folklore. SCP-5201 is especially vulnerable when its upper torso is out hunting, so it will always take the utmost care to hide its abandoned lower torso in a secret, secure location. If you can find the hidden lower torso, it is possible to kill SCP-5201 by sprinkling its exposed viscera with spices like garlic, salt, or vinegar, or, failing that, even ash or urine. This causes an unusual reaction that is not yet fully understood by Foundation researchers, but will prevent the two halves from rejoining. If the two halves of the Mananangal cannot rejoin before dawn, sunlight will kill the creature. If none of these methods are available, it is also possible to repel SCP-5201 by using a specialized whip fashioned from the tail of a stingray. The SCP Foundation currently has an undisclosed number of domesticated SCP-5201 instances held in the fauna containment wing of Site-235. 
Because this species has been known to practice cannibalism, each specimen is to be held in its own personal containment cell. While there are obvious ethical and logistical concerns with feeding human organs to SCP-5201, the Foundation has discovered that SCP-5201 can still easily thrive on a diet of any newborn mammal with a mass of at least one kilogram. Piglets have so far proven to be the most cost-effective and available options, but other species can be substituted as necessary. All entrances to SCP-5201 containment cells are to be guarded by at least two Level 2 personnel equipped with stingray whips, crucifixes, or some other object found to cause harm to SCP-5201. Unlike humans, SCP-5201 have an unusual asexual reproductive process. The lower body can regenerate a new upper torso via a process similar to epimorphic regeneration observed in autonomous lizards. Upper torso of an SCP-5201 would leave behind the parent's lower torso to search for a compatible female human. SCP-5201 would attack and consume this human, claiming her lower torso as its own smearing ash, urine, or spices into the exposed innards of the lower torso inhibits this process and prevents effective reproduction. The exact origin of SCP-5201 is unknown. Although the creature is endemic throughout the Philippines, and historical records indicate that it has inhabited the island since at least 1500, when it was first described by Spanish sailors to the islands, fossil remains and genetic testing indicate that it is actually an invasive species from outside the Philippine archipelago. SCP-5201 is currently believed to be extinct in the wild, following eradication efforts by the Foundation in the 1990s. An epidemic of SCP-5201 attacks in the early 90s prompted the SCP Foundation to join forces with the Supernatural Committee of the Philippines and the Global Occult Coalition to take action to prevent SCP-5201 from spreading to other countries. Dubbed Project Dipsy, the operation involved amnesticizing the major cities of the Philippines, funding propaganda campaigns to dismiss SCP-5201 as a product of folklore and urban legends, and eventually domesticating the surviving SCP-5201 population for cellular regeneration research. Because of its aggressiveness and taste for human flesh, SCP-5201 specimens regularly attempt to breach containment, and thus have been given the designation Euclid. And while the SCP Foundation has done its best to eliminate the threat of SCP-5201 in the wild, there's no guarantee that a few instances of this vicious monster might have slipped through the cracks and possibly even spread out into the wider world beyond its home in the Philippines. You still might want to search your room for any suspicious cracks or holes before you bed down for the night, because there are very few things less pleasant than waking up from restless dreams to find a long, slimy tongue jammed down your throat. The girl sighs and slumps in her seat kicking at the back of the bucket seat in front of her. Her mother, sitting in the car's front passenger side seat, doesn't even notice. She's too busy taking photographs out the window and chattering with her husband who's driving the car. That's all they've been doing all day, and the girl is sick to death of it. Her parents dragged her on this stupid vacation trip, and now she's got to waste her whole summer away from her friends. She stares out the window and watches the pastoral countryside slide past. The quaint little villages and rolling hillsides really excite her parents, but she could not care less. Mom and Dad planned this family vacation across Europe for months, but she would much rather have gone someplace interesting instead. There are only so many boring old castles and stupid cathedrals that you can look at before you just lose your mind. The girl sighs and crosses her arms across her chest in silent resignation. Guess we're just gonna look at more dumb buildings, she mutters. Honey, can you stop that? Your father worked really hard to put this trip together, and the least you could do is pretend to have a good time," says her mother, momentarily lowering her camera to berate her ungrateful daughter. Huh? It's the first time that her mother has acknowledged her all day. I think you're really gonna like today's itinerary, says her father, grinning as if he's got a delicious secret that he can't wait to share. We know it's been hard for you spending your whole summer away from home, so today we're gonna do something just for you. Uh-huh, says the girl. Sure, Dad. She rolls her eyes and pulls out a cell phone. At least she can still get internet access out here. Desperate for something to distract her from the monotony of this car trip, she quickly scrolls through her feed and reads all the notes that her friends back home are posting. She frowns. Her classmates are all posting about the latest blockbuster film in the girl's favorite media franchise, Vampire Boyfriend. She grits her teeth. She likes to consider herself a Vampire Boyfriend superfan. She's a well-known poster in the Vampire Boyfriend online community, famous for her fanfiction as well as her own original character, Vampire Girlfriend. In fact, her writing is somewhat controversial. 
A lot of vampire boyfriend purists have accused her character Vampire Girlfriend of being a Mary Sue, and they object to her stories where a vampire boyfriend meets and falls madly in love with her, to the point that he forgets his canon lover from the film series, Vampire Wife. She's annoyed to see that her friends got to see the new Vampire Boyfriend movie on opening night, while she's stuck out here on this stupid family vacation. The movie won't premiere in Europe for another few months, and there's no way she's going to be able to avoid spoilers for that long. Everything about this situation seems tailor-made to irritate her, and the excited giggles of her parents in the front of the car as they exchange <laughs> knowing glances are only annoying her more. Trust me, you're gonna love this, says her father again. He peers at an unfolded roadmap in his lap, mutters something under his breath, and turns the car off the main highway and onto a narrow gravel road. The girl grits her teeth as the car rattles over the uneven ground so hard that it nearly jostles her cell phone from her grasp. She tries to distract herself by typing some notes to herself, plot points for the latest Vampire Boyfriend fanfiction that she's working on. In her new story, Vampire Girlfriend is going to be kidnapped by werewolves, leading Vampire Boyfriend to have an existential crisis as he struggles to find meaning in a world without his beloved. She makes a note that Vampire Girlfriend should look, dress, and talk just like her. After all, she imagines, wouldn't she be the perfect match for Vampire Boyfriend? She pauses, a momentary, dreamy expression on her face, as she imagines how much better a weekend together with Vampire Boyfriend would be compared to this boring car trip. This can't be right, mumbles her father, scanning the horizon. But the directions said. Suddenly he brightens up. Oh, there it is. Playland. The girl cranes her neck to see that the car is fast approaching what appears to be a little carnival at the end of the road. She rolls her eyes. Oh, great. Of course, her parents would take her here. First, they bore her with endless visits to museums and historical sites, and now, when they want to make it all up to her, they take her to a carnival for babies. She's not a kid anymore, but her parents still think that this sort of goofy nonsense should excite her. I know you've been bored going to all the historical sites with us, Honey Pumpkin, says her father as he pulls the car into a parking spot and applies the brake. That's why I asked the hotel concierge if there was anything good around here for kids. And wouldn't you know it, the next morning, what did I find shoved under our door? Three free tickets. He holds up the tickets as if they were a trophy he'd won. The girl's mother nods approvingly. Now that's good service, I hope you left him a big tip. The girl groans. You can't be serious, Dad. A carnival? What, do you expect me to ride on the teacups or something? I'm 15, I'm not a dumb baby anymore. Language, young lady, admonishes her mother as she unbuckles her seatbelt. Your father worked really hard to find this place just for you. The least you could do is show a little gratitude for once. Oh, you think you're too old now, says her father. But I bet once we see some of these rides, boy, I'll bet you feel just like a kid again. He inhales deeply. Even inside the car, the unmistakable fair smells of funnel cake and corn dogs are in the air. You smell that? It smells like fun. Sure, fun. The girl pockets her cell phone. The family exits the car and walks toward the Playland gate, where they're greeted by a costumed employee. Welcome to Playland, announces the employee in a chipper voice. Your favorite amusement park. When you're at Playland, you'll find that the worries of the day melt away, and it's time for play. Oh, you speak English, says the father. He turns to the mother. See, now that's service. He hands over the complimentary tickets. The employee takes them with a smile and a flourish, and then ushers the family through the gate. The girl, however, can't stop staring at the gatekeeper. If she didn't know any better, she would think that he was dressed like Vampire Boyfriend. But that doesn't make any sense. It must just be a coincidence. But once they enter the park, she sees that all the employees are dressed like Vampire Boyfriend. The guy standing behind the counter of the ring toss booth, the guy manning the balloon station. The uniform for this park looks like the outfit that she imagined Vampire Boyfriend would be wearing in her first fanfiction story. Wait, says the girl, staring up at the bundle of helium balloons floating above the balloon vendor. Each balloon bears the name Vampire Boyfriend and the fanged bat logo of the film series. So it's not a coincidence at all? This theme park really is themed after her favorite films? Her father notices her change of expression, and he nudges her in the ribs. Eh? Eh? I told you that you like it. This is all about those movies you like so much, huh? Ghost Boyfriend or whatever? It's Vampire Boyfriend, Dad, she says distantly, but she's too mesmerized by her surroundings to put much feeling into the barb. How much for a balloon? asks her father, pulling open his wallet and quickly thumbing through a stack of local currency. Oh, no charge, says the balloon vendor brightly. He plucks a string from the bundle and hands it over. Everything's free for our valued special ticket holders. Well, would you listen to that, says her father. He replaces his wallet in his back pocket. Now, this is the kind of carnival that I wish we had back in the States. The girl awkwardly takes the proffered balloon. She feels silly holding it, but she's more confused about why it's free. 
The whole point of offering free entry into a carnival is to gouge people with overpriced rides and souvenirs, right? But everywhere she looks, she can't help but notice signs advertising free corn dogs and bumper cars, unlimited rides for zero dollars. How can this carnival make enough money to keep operating if it's not charging for anything? In fact, how can this carnival make enough money to keep operating when it's based around a niche film like Vampire Boyfriend? Are there really that many Vampire Boyfriend fans out here to keep this place in business? Not that there's anyone else around. As she scans her surroundings, she realizes that, while there are plenty of costume employees bustling around the fair, she doesn't see any other fair goers. It's as if this whole carnival was created and maintained solely for her benefit. Hey, Pumpkin, how about a ride? I bet you'd love to try out some bumper cars, huh? Says her father. How about we go for a race and you can see if you can beat your old man, huh? He points to a bumper car ride across the midway. The girl stares. Like all the other rides, it's covered in vampire boyfriend murals. This one depicts a young woman running away from a pack of werewolves, and the young woman looks exactly like the girl. It couldn't be. But there's no other explanation. The young woman in the mural matches exactly the description of the girl's character Vampire Girlfriend from her fanfiction story, and the image of the werewolves looks like it's an illustration of the scene where Vampire Girlfriend gets kidnapped. How could this be? Could it be that the artist, obviously a fan of the Vampire Boyfriend films, is also familiar with her fanfiction? But even if that was the case, it's absurd to think that he would use it as an inspiration for a theme park ride. Who other than her would possibly recognize this scene? Hmm, says the girl's mother, walking up behind her and peering at the mural. Why, that girl looks just like you. I know, she does, says the girl quickly. It's almost a relief to know that her mother has also noticed the resemblance. At least it means that she's not imagining things. At the same time, she feels a twinge of guilt. Readers online are always accusing her of using Vampire Girlfriend as a thinly disguised self-insert. Seeing this larger-than-life picture of Vampire Girlfriend makes her think that there might be some merit to the accusation. Come on, you lot, stop worrying about some old picture and let's have some fun, says her father. He offers money to the ticket taker parked behind the kiosk, but the man merely shakes his head. Your money is no good here, sir, says the ticket taker. The bumper cars are free for our favorite guests today. Their father clambers into the rink and ambles toward a bumper car. Her mother tugs at the girl's arm as if to encourage her to join in, but the girl resists. Come on, what's gotten into you? says her mother. This place is just weird, says the girl. Like, half of the stuff here isn't even from the official vampire boyfriend lore. It's all stuff that I made up for my stories. Her mother rolls her eyes in annoyance. Really, we go to all this trouble to find something that you would like to do, and all you want to do is complain? I'm sorry, ma'am, is there some problem here? The family is startled as another employee walks up to them. He's also dressed like vampire boyfriend, and a wide smile is plastered across his face. You folks look like you're upset about something. You're damn right I'm upset about something, yells the girl. In her rage, she throws her drink at the employee. He barely reacts as the cup explodes against his chest, dousing him with sticky soda. What's going on here? Where did you hear about Vampire Girlfriend? Ma'am, Playland is designed to give every visitor the perfect experience, says the employee blandly. That's not good enough. Tell me what's going on here. The employee's attitude changes on a dime. His bright smile fades, and suddenly his tone turns stern. Ma'am, I'm afraid that you're going to ruin everyone's fun if you keep up this sort of behavior. We like to keep things fun here at Playland. If you want to spoil the fun, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave. Fine, then we'll leave. Oh, come on, young lady, we just got here, snaps her mother. We literally drove all day to get here and you want to leave after just one ride? You don't even like rides. There's a principle involved here, says her father sternly as he saunters up. Young lady, if that's your attitude, then I think maybe you should go wait in the car, because your mother and I intend to have a good time. The girl doesn't have a chance to argue. The employee rests his hands heavily on her shoulders and turns her around. Don't worry, folks. We'll escort her back to your car. You can join her as well when you're ready. The girl cannot believe what's happening. The employee politely but firmly steers her toward the exit, and Frog marches her out the gate. He abandons her in the parking lot, tipping his hat and smiling brightly before he disappears back inside the park. Please try to enjoy yourself, ma'am, until your parents are ready to join you. In the meantime, why don't you work on that new fanfiction you've been planning? How do you know about that? yells the girl. The employee doesn't answer, simply turning and fading back into the crowd. She rushes to the gate, but the gatekeeper stops her. Sorry, ma'am, no re-entry without a ticket. But I have a ticket, she cries. You saw it, my dad gave it to you like half an hour ago. Come on, you can't be serious. She tries to push past him, but the gatekeeper grabs her wrists with surprising strength and holds her. 
Still smiling, he firmly escorts her back out to her car before releasing her. Please, ma'am, don't make a scene. You're going to disturb our guests. Who's in charge here? I, I need to talk to the manager. I want my parents back right now. The gatekeeper doesn't even respond. He simply returns to his station. There's nothing that the girl can do now but wait. She sits down in the gravel and leans her back against the side of the car. Minutes turn to hours, and still her parents haven't returned. Eventually, she goes back to yell at the gatekeeper again. Where are my parents? They should have been back hours ago. Sorry, ma'am. I guess your parents are just having too much fun right now. I'm sure you'll see them again soon, though, says the gatekeeper. The girl shivers as she feels a bite in the cool twilight air. She notices that the sun is starting to dip behind the mountains. It'll be dark soon. How much longer could they take? Even if they decided to ride on every ride in the park, surely they would be done by now. What time does the park close? Asks the girl, a note of panic rising in her voice. The gatekeeper blinks serenely. Playland is open 24-7, ma'am. We're always here when you want to play. The girl feels the color drain from her face as she ponders the possibilities. Her father has the car keys, so she can't take the car to go for help. She pulls out her cell phone, but she doesn't know the number she would need to alert any local authorities. And it's not like she speaks the language anyway. Other than the employees here at Playland, she hasn't met a single person in this whole trip who speaks English. She's completely helpless, trapped, and there's nothing that she can do except wait and hope. As the night settles in, she realizes that her wait might have just started. <laughs> it might not be the happiest place on Earth, but it definitely tries to be. And while the world is full of sketchy amusement parks, most of them just want your money. The amusement park known as SCP-1357, however, genuinely wants you to have a good time. Sometimes it wants you to have a good time, whether you want to or not. SCP-1357 is a theme park with an area of approximately 4 square kilometers, located somewhere in Poland. The park has four entrances, at each of the cardinal directions. SCP-1357 is highly selective about who it allows to enter the park, restricting access to parties that meet the following criteria. The group must contain at least two adults in a romantic relationship. It must contain at least one member who is under the age of 18 and who thinks of the aforementioned romantic couple as their guardians. And every member of the party must possess a free ticket, hereafter referred to as SCP-1357-B. The park does not charge for admission, and the only way to gain access is to have possession of an instance of SCP-1357-B. Once inside, SCP-1357 looks like any other carnival, with thrill rides, amusement arcades, midway games, and concession booths. Highly unusual for a carnival, though, is that SCP-1357 does not accept any money. All rides, food, and souvenirs are free. The layout and theme of the park are different for different visitors and appear to be highly contingent on the desires of the youngest member of any visiting party. Often, the park will appear themed after various popular media properties, such as Batman, Winnie the Pooh, or Barney the Dinosaur. However, visiting parties accompanied by more imaginative kids may encounter substantially weirder things in the park, including talking animals, sentient foodstuffs, temporal displacements, and even extra-dimensional portals. Although the park normally sits empty, when a group meeting entry requirements arrive at the gate, SCP-1357 will spontaneously manifest a full working staff, people designated as SCP-1357-A. Instances of SCP-1357-A appear to be ordinary humans of various ages, ethnicities, sexes, and genders, all clothed in matching uniforms, suggesting that they are employees of the park. Instances of SCP-1357-A are exceptionally friendly and helpful, and are extremely dedicated to making sure that visitors to SCP-1357 have a good time. In fact, there's nothing that they care about more. There is, however, a darker side to SCP-1357, and one incident suggests the frightening lengths to which the park will go to make sure that its younger visitors truly enjoy their stay. As part of an experiment, a Foundation agent visited the park with his own family, each member equipped with audio recording devices that continuously transmitted to Foundation consoles. During his stay, he attempted to interrogate an instance of SCP-1357-A. The instance of SCP-1357-A refused to answer the agent's questions about the purpose or origin of the park, instead lamenting that the agent's attitude was going to spoil the fun for his family. Eventually, instances of SCP-1357-A escorted the agent to an exit and forcibly removed him from the park. When his wife attempted to follow him, the couple's daughter refused to leave. 
Instances of SCP-1357-A separated the daughter from her family, removing the wife from the park and keeping the daughter inside, leaving the parents with only vague assurances that their daughter would be returned when she was ready to leave the park. Attempts to forcibly recover the daughter proved futile, and even a well-armed rescue team was unable to overcome the seemingly infinite numbers of SCP-1357-A that SCP-1357 manifested to protect itself. Hopes that SCP-1357 might indeed allow the daughter to leave once she became bored with the park attractions also proved to be futile. Audio captured from the daughter's recording device seems to indicate that when she eventually demanded that SCP-1357-A's release her, she was instead placed into some sort of machine that altered or brainwashed her into becoming an SCP-1357-A herself. Subsequent park visits by Foundation researchers have revealed a new SCP-1357-A that matches the daughter's physical description but does not display any memories of her past life. Interactions with the SCP-1357-A that resembles the missing daughter reveal that, like other instances of SCP-1357-A, her only thoughts are on how to please park visitors and help them enjoy a pleasant visiting experience. In the end, Playland may offer the ultimate amusement park experience for free but it might still exact a price that's way too high. If you want to support our important mission while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1550, for another tale of a product determined to please every customer. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.